Since that time, we've met with him, I think, twice. And he has uh, submitted us with 
various proposals. We've, uh, as we, I believe, mentioned at that time, we had talked with the people in Alabama, the officers of the Alabama Labor Council, about a program they have, which uh, <coughs> involves lead time. Now, we're told that they tried to negotiate with manufacturers that manufactured tires in Alabama and failed. And finally, they came to an agreement with the distributor for lead top. We talked with them and got brochures from them, given the retail price and the price that Lee was making tires available to their members, the members of the affiliated <coughs> union. We take that and begin to do some research on um, tire prices, tire programs. I began to cut out uh, tire specials out of the newspapers and whatnot. We met with Mr. Price, we pulled all of this on him. Of course, you get into this bit of who's got the best tire and who makes the best one, who's got the best tread, widest tread, and the prettiest <coughs> white strips, and all that kind of stuff. We finally, I think, convinced him that we wasn't gonna just go into a tire program, just to say we had a tire program. So, uh, Claude finally asked him in our last meeting prior to today if he knew anything about the art of collective bargaining which he didn't, evidently. And uh, we told him that he ought to go back to Armstrong and tell him to give him a little elbow room, you know, so he could negotiate a little bit. Well, <coughs> uh, I checked, uh, during that period of time, I checked a Lee tire. And I also checked the Armstrong tire to see the difference in the tread, the, the depth of the tread, and also price to retail price. And uh, we met with Mr. Uh, Price again this morning, the executive committee did, and of course, to our surprise, he didn't have any new offers to make. He says that he has spoke with the officials of Armstrong, Brother Fly. I understand they've indicated some of your folks uh, a desire to work out an agreement with him. We felt that Armstrong, the size of their company, they could absorb any further uh, cut in price and I don't know if he's really pressing them or if uh, he's not and just trying to sell us a bill of goods. But anyway, he says that he's talked to them about this, one or two different ways of, re of lowering this price he's made to us, member price. And uh, anyway, the committee uh, voted just a few minutes ago to recommend to this board that Claude and I be given the authority to continue these negotiations to try to determine if we can work out anything that would be suitable. Now, there is one other thing that enters into this. Mr. Price's dealers, they're known as the right price group. He's what you call a marketing specialist or something. He's got a considerable number, about 25 dealers. There's a few areas where we've got a heavy concentration of members that he don't have a dealer right. He's working on it, according to him. I think that could be worked out, but there's one thing that occurred to the committee to be a problem. Even if we could work out a better price, and that's the fact that his dealers are mostly car dealers. Now, we know that a lot of these car dealers, uh, the shops, as a matter of fact, service departments not open at all on Saturday and some only till noon. And of course, that's when a lot of working people would be shopping for tires. We're not sure if they have adequate service people to mount and balance these tires. This is something we have to check. For instance, his dealer here. Now, there's another problem, too, that enters into it. There's four, three Armstrong tire dealers in Jackson, but now only one of them is his dealer, and that's Fowler Buick. There's not too many average working people that probably know where Fowler Buick is. Now, I've been to Fowler Buick shopping around with an automobile on one or more occasions. I've been down there on other business, and uh, the, the way things are situated, I, I kind of wonder as to what position they would be in to uh, mount and balance tires. Now, another instance is that I'm somewhat acquainted with is down at Hattiesburg, the Pontiac place on Broadway Drive, West Pine Street. Uh, I don't know about that, but anyway, uh, here's, get back to the price. Here's a meat and a coconut. <coughs> I have newspaper ads right here that I've cut out of the, tore out of the Jackson paper where Goodrich, Firestone, Goodyear, 
Pennsylvania, U.S. Royal, you name it, all of your better known titles. They're running specials one right after the other. And some of these specials are cheaper than the price he's offered us for the members. Now, it's simple. We'd look pretty silly if we negotiated a tire program. Just say we have a tire program, and a person could just anybody go down there about anywhere and buy a tire as cheap as the person with one of our green cars. Now, a lot of people don't really look at the tread. I'm sure that when you compare the Armstrong tire to the Lee tire, Armstrong is far superior tire, based on my examination of the two tires this week. But uh, here again, we don't think we've got anything attractive enough to uh, really go into all of the work that it's going to take to implement a tire program. So that is the proposal this committee makes uh, to this board on the tire program that Claude and I be authorized to continue this effort to see if we can pull any strings or do anything else to help bring about what we consider a more acceptable price. Uh, and then, of course, we've got these other problems to consider further in addition to that. You want me to go ahead with the other? No, I'll just make an offer motion. Uh, I'll, let, me, uh, let, me, let me ask one question. Yeah. Next time you talk to this young man, ask him if he'd give you the price list that they give the state employees, like school teachers, uh, civil service, anybody that works for the state. They got a special price for them. It's just about the same price that the employees pay for them in the point. Just oh, ask him that. that. That, that's pretty good because Slim gave me a few of those on the phone. Those Just as the state employees, because some of the guys that work in the shop there at home, their wife teaches school and they buy tires for everybody. Mm -hmm. And they got a special price for state employees <coughs> like highway department, uh, school teachers, anybody that works right. in the state in the area there. <coughs> Just ask him. And I'll try to get you one of those price lists for the state right. employees if I get a hold of one. Mr. Chairman, I'll move, excuse me, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll yeah. move the adoption of this. <coughs> Continue the uh, I'll second that. All right, it's now open for discussion. We got a discussion on the motion. That is that that we reject uh, Mr. Price's offer or suggestion on the tire program and continue trying to negotiate a better deal of what it amounts to. We have a discussion. I talked to the factory manager on several occasions and this thing all of the shipping and distribution of tires has been moved mm -hmm. to Jackson. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh even down our adjustments are made out of employees buy a tire. They got to send an order to Jackson, then they send it back to the warehouse to match, and then it's given to the employees in the plant. So, I mean, it's actually down there. Uh, but I'll, I'll uh, why, why are you talking about this? Well, we'll, 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 you know, ask you to work on the thing with yeah. us. Uh, okay. Approach the company, uh, <coughs> you know, whoever you have to talk to, because <laughs> obviously what it amounts to is that the company is going to have to make Mr. Price a better price the dealers a better price for him to come down and get more competitive and give us a better deal. Well, he's got a better competitive price than what he's giving to you. I mean, well, I don't know. Uh, he, uh, uh, I was a little disappointed today after that meeting that Tom and I had with him the other day that he didn't come in with a better proposal because I didn't think the proposition he offered the other day would be acceptable either. I don't know what they were, but I know right. he Well, that. he's anywhere from 2 to $5 uh, higher than the than the Alabama program the sales and so forth that go on. Uh, we have another discussion on this now. Not all in favor of the motion signified to say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. <coughs> now we got another matter that was considered this morning uh, also uh, to make a recommendation to you on here this afternoon. <coughs> Brother uh, Knight will continue. <coughs> this, this will be new to a few members <coughs> of the board. After the 1968 convention, I believe, the uh, subject of uh, some type of retirement for the full-time employees of the organization was discussed, meaning the, the full-time officers and the office staff. Uh, in the light of the fact that there was no pension, uh, no retirement plan established by the national organization, uh, in which the employees of state councils could participate. After considerable uh, discussion and investigation, uh, there was a severance pay plan initiated, set up and initiated, 
and the five vice presidents of the council were named as the management committee. I believe that's the way it's called. Anyway, they were named as the managers. Now, Brother Schaefer, at that time, was appointed chairman of that committee. He did, uh, I guess, a larger portion of the leg work, which uh, and we had to get uh, some expert assistance in putting this thing together. Anyway, it's something mm -hmm. like this, that each month, uh, or each payday, rather, the first and the 15th, uh, there is two and a half percent of our salaries, Claude and mine, and the two girls in the office, deducted from our checks. And uh, then the council, the state AFL-CIO matches that with two and a half percent. This is deposited in the First Federal Savings and Loan Association here. It's in five accounts. One is the employees of the Mississippi AFL-CIO, and then another account in each, uh, four or more accounts in each of the names of the Claude and mine, Diane and Carol. Uh, and of course, since that time, this has been a little better than four years ago, the organization has drawn some, everything's gone up. The affiliation is uh, all considerably better and improving uh, slowly, but surely, we think. Council's in better financial condition. The committee this morning <coughs> reviewed this plan to this extent that uh, the, the executive board, the executive committee, rather, adopted a, a motion recommending to the full board that they, the management committee, uh, be given the authority to review this plan and, of course, to review the financial status of the state AFL-CIO and see whether or not it would be possible to increase the contribution by the council into this. And incidentally, the, the two girls in the office, uh, we don't know as, as of this moment whether they would want to increase their contribution or not. This has not been brought up, but it will be by the committee. And to see whether or not there could be some plan, several different suggestions was made in the committee meeting this morning for ways of, in, of increasing the uh, contribution into this fund. And also, if they determine that the council is not able yet at this time to increase its contribution to the fund to decide whether or not, under the language of this agreement, that the employees could increase their contribution. So to make a long story short, the motion there is that the management committee, and then I guess, well, I guess we better get this motion off first. Uh, there's another motion subsequent to that, which is not all that important, really. But anyway, the motion is that the uh, executive board authorize the vice president to review this plan and see whether or not it can be improved in way of benefit, uh, meaning that uh, whether or not the council is able to contribute any more and uh, whether or not they feel that it is, or, and then further to look into the possibility of the employee himself putting in additional money, which all it amounts to is just a savings account, really. That, Mr. Chairman, I move the adoption of that motion. You heard the report the motion to adopt it. You get a second? Second. Do we have any discussion? <coughs> Not only in favor of the motion, single <coughs> like to say and I. Opposed? Motion carried and sorted. Of course, the whatever is done in this area will be reported back uh, to the next meeting of the board, hopefully, uh, for anything that's done. There's one other motion. One other motion? Mr. President, that, right. uh, that Vice President Schaefer and Jackson yeah. uh, constitute a subcommittee of the executive committee to spearhead this uh, uh, re-evaluation or review of this plan. And I, uh, they, they recommend that, and I'll move the adoption of that. Okay. You don't necessarily have to concur, Mr. Mitchell. Well, I uh, was going to suggest it wasn't any point in voting on that one, but uh, I guess maybe we ought to now that some objections. Is there any secret of the board knowing what kind of plan we got now? 
Uh, I don't know. I mean, just what he reviewed with you was the plan. The, uh, it's a little severance plan thing, Bob. It uh, was put in effect about four years ago. Uh, give him a copy. Yeah, we had a copy for, up for the committee up there a while ago. No, I was just wondering if it's based on so much per year of service. Or no. I mean, boy, the pension, I ain't talking about the seven. No, it's, uh, it's strictly seven. So that's all we got is that. Uh, and at that time, the time this was put into effect, it was about all that could be done. <laughs> and uh, the uh, committee feels that we might be in a little better shape now to improve on it, see? Well, I, I was just wondering, because we... Yeah. Well, it's, uh, uh, how do, how, let me ask another question. I mean, yeah. I'm going to ask a lot of questions. How do you get around negotiating with these people for a pension plan? Well, we, uh, they. Negotiate they when they ain't got no money. You have to have <laughs> money to negotiate. Now, right. look, look, now, you talking to management, but we talking about later. We, the management tells us this all the time that we ain't got the money. I mean, uh, well, that's a fact. Of this they have very thing. understanding all the sales. Oh, I know they do, and no <laughs> question about that. I mean, well, when this thing was put into effect, the committee chaired by Brother Schaefer there, I think, uh, did an excellent job. Uh, they went as far as they could in setting it up, but the committee <coughs> feels now that uh, due to the growth of the organization and that we are in a little better shape, that maybe we ought to reevaluate well, it and see I'm if it can be improved. I'm in favor of a pension plan. Well, we'll have to negotiate with the office workers around the 1st of April, and hopefully we'll have this information ready for well, that time to see that. All right. Uh, the motion was that. Uh, uh, point of information, yes. Mr. Chairman. <laughs> On this subcommittee, can yes. we assume that uh, due to the fact it's going to take some time yeah. and maybe some travel, that these uh, this committee will be compensated for their? Uh, well, absolutely. I think it'll be uh, uh, authorized minister of the organization. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. If they have to come to Jackson or whatever, you know. Uh, Expenses and bob it certainly be reimbursed. Right. That's a policy of the organization. Sure yeah. I, feel, I feel the same way. Well, the motion was, I think, to uh, uh, point Brother Schaefer and Brother uh, Jackson as a committee of two to do the legwork on, on the program. Any discussion on that motion? Not all in favor of the motion signify it by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. Well, we just cut off an hour uh, loud on the program, so that uh, <laughs> might help some of you folks get on the road a little bit. Right. So. Well, I can make a point. Yeah, I appreciate I Brother Taylor it. getting up on the expense, but I don't ever turn in any of my expenses to this organization. My own organization will bear any expense that I have in connection with Well, we're going to have to start making arrangements for you to make some of these trips I have to make. I just want to be sure you got that. All right, let's Thank get on down with the reports then. Uh, if you I notice there, we got a number of people listed uh, to give us a report. This is a, a matter of information more than anything else to keep the board informed on the uh, different programs and activities that we have going from time to time. Uh, listed first on the agenda is our good watch director, Mrs. Amy Hollowell from Water Valley, who put in a lot of hard hours with us during the recent uh, congressional elections. Amy, are you ready to give us a report? Mm. We I don't want a great lengthy that. speech now, but we'd like to give you a chance to uh, tell us what went on. So, uh, well, I, I think everybody knows what went I on. I want to hear <laughs> the speech that you made to the, to the, to the voters. Oh, oh. Down well, that's very short. No, 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 it won't be if she gives them the same one that she gives in Greenville. Oh. <laughs> um, well, I don't have much to tell. Everybody know how, knows how the elections come out. But that morning I heard on the news uh, who won and who didn't win. I like to fell out of my chair when I heard about Bodron, and uh, I couldn't believe it, and I uh, should have known, too. But, uh, um... Just let me give you an estimate or a couple that happened here in Hines County in which we all knew that uh, we had to take Hines County to win. But uh, it didn't come out that way. Claude and Tom can tell you that uh, we didn't have any help here in Hines County. And of course, I'm bad. I have a bad mouth. When it should be kept shut. You say we, you mean the labor movement? Yeah, but 
anyway, one night, um, we didn't have any help at all, and I didn't work uh, a couple of three nights, I guess, with the girl doing phone, telephone. But uh, we couldn't get the cooperation out of Bozon's uh, campaign people, or at least I couldn't. And uh, they wanted to do it different. They wanted a long, drawn-out affair, and, and I asked this campaign manager, uh, forget his name. In fact, I didn't know who I was talking to when I called up. I was looking for Bill Pyle and got this other guy over the, all of the county. And uh, so I told him that uh, that I felt like somebody was falling down on the job and it wasn't labor. And oh, I don't really, I can't remember how what all I did say to him. Then I, it maybe it dawned on me that I better ask who I was talking to. And he told me, but anyway, I didn't take back anything I said. And I told him they was going to lose the election if they didn't get up on their can and go to work. Well, I guess they believe me now. But uh, I felt like uh, maybe uh, maybe I didn't work hard enough. Uh, I don't know what else I could have done, but uh, maybe I should have got in there and butt head with them a little more. But uh, I don't know. Some people, you can't make a believer out of them. And, uh, of course, down in the 5th District, I didn't do much down there. I went down there a couple of times, but it didn't look good over around Russell and Barry to me. And I don't know what they did, but anyway, he lost. <laughs> and, uh, but we did have one good good one anyway. At least it makes it, made me feel better that Bo uh, Bowen did take all 16 counties in the 2nd District. And uh, I got a letter, I think, from Ellis Bodron and also from David Bowen. And uh, David Bowen uh, told me if any time I was up in Washington or around, would come by and to his office to see him. And that he'd been aiming to write me sooner, but uh, he'd been so busy, and which I could understand that, and uh, that he hadn't gotten around to doing it. But uh, down in, I like to work myself to death down in Adams County two days. And I was really disappointed when I found out that Bodron didn't even take Adams County. I was really disappointed in that county. And uh, Tom sent me down there to help Laura Baker. And I was down there a day and a half. And she was off one day and the other day I worked by myself and uh, that was somewhere else you couldn't get Bodron's people to cooperate with you. They uh, didn't have the campaign time. manager was it? When you were there and we were talking to you, we couldn't even find out who the campaign manager couldn't find any literature, could we? Now this uh, Peter Butchers was the only one that worked. Now, I can say that he did work, but he and Laura Baker, uh, they was all over that town working for him, but uh, this campaign manager, Laura, called him. I can't remember or recall his name. But she called him to, uh, for him to get me some help the next day. He didn't know anybody. He wasn't even interested. In, uh, and ev down the people down there that I talked with, they were worried about Hines County. They thought they had Adams County. And I told them they couldn't uh, ever be sure until the last vote was counted. And uh, I worked one day down there all day by myself and Tom had told me to not and Claude also told me to not go out to this plant by myself but uh, I had a promise of two people to come and help me we was going to lease at this place and uh, this international paper company I think. and uh, so I got out there Laura told me to not get inside the gate and stay up on the road and, and I was waiting on these other people to come and uh, all these cars beginning to go in and I decided well if you're going to get anything done you have to do it yourself. So I got out there uh, leasing in that place by myself and I had traffic blocked all the way from the front gate up to the top of the hill. But anyway they were all real nice. They stopped and waited on me to hand them the, I think I was giving out a, a ballot and a letter from Bozong. <coughs> But uh, that's just, and the longer I, the faster I worked, the better I got, and just fussing to myself, saying that 
well, if you want the thing done, you have to do it yourself. And uh, when I come back and tell him, Claude and Tom about it, Claude said, well, that wasn't your job to do that. And I said, well, don't you remember Curtis Ullman saying that uh, whatever you have to do to get the job done, do it. See? And then I said, if, if I thought that was going to get the job done, I was out there doing it. And, uh, even though it really wasn't part of my job, but we were trying to get Bull Drawn elected. And, uh, and if, that, if it took that, I was uh, more than willing to do so. But, uh, in the, but the second district, uh, we have two different kinds of people in the fourth and the second district. They're different, all together different. They really are. <laughs> and uh, you don't, you wouldn't know until you worked in both districts like I did. And, uh, but uh, up there, they are, uh, uh, Bowen people were willing and eager and begging for you to help them. And down here, they, they were sitting back and let us do the work. And, uh, and I told uh, Senator Bodron over to rally in Vicksburg if, uh, if he lost, it wouldn't be Labor's fault. But uh, because we were out working for him, but uh, Labor somehow fell down when they went to the polls. They either didn't go vote for him or just stayed at home or voted for Thad Cochran because uh, I think if, uh, if all the Labor had voted, went out and voted for <coughs> him, I know he would have won. And, uh, and then, of course, we have a lot of uh, ifs and buts. And, uh, and I really don't know what happened. Tom told me a little bit what went on on election day here in Pines County, here in Jackson. And, uh, of course, that didn't help matters then either. And, um, and another thing, uh, I don't think the blacks went out and voted for Bodron. But uh, I feel like that maybe they got wind of what went on down in the headquarters that I run into down there one night. And I feel like maybe that was, that could be one of the reasons that uh, he didn't get elected. Uh, and I said I was going to blame Bob Woodson because huh. maybe he's like he's me. He's following you, Bob. Yeah, I'm going to take issue with that. Too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, Bob, I got to blame somebody. <laughs> now, I, I felt like maybe it was most of it was my fault. Maybe uh, I just kept saying to myself when I found out he lost it, maybe I didn't work hard enough. I don't know what I did wrong. But now the reason I'm not mentioning the 5th District much, I wouldn't, I don't really know what went on down there. I was down there a couple of times. But uh, I do know he lost, but we was kind of, you know, thinking about upset down there, but hoping we win. But uh, all in all, um, maybe next time uh, we'll win, and maybe maybe uh, maybe we can get our people together. <coughs> and the main thing, maybe we can get together with the campaign people. Uh, and I think that was our biggest problem here in Hines County and down in Adams County. And I, uh, even though uh, uh, maybe. I didn't work hard enough, but I still think that we didn't get enough cooperation out of the campaign people here in Hines County and Adams County. But I know if we got that kind of co cooperation like we did up in the east end of the state, where I worked more than, uh, than I did over in the west end of the district too, but uh, now if we'd had people down here working like they were working up there, I would vote on either one. I just know he would. So I don't know uh, uh, if anybody wants to know what I did day by day. I, that seemed like it's been a century ago. Uh, <coughs> I've been trying to forget it. <laughs> and um, I, I made a day by day report of it and turned it into the office. Uh, so if anybody, uh, any of the board members or anyone wanted to know what I was uh, doing all that time, I was running from here to there. and. Uh, so maybe I was on the road too much and wasn't in one place long enough, and maybe that's the reason he lost. I don't know. But uh, anyway, maybe next time we'll do better. I hope so anyway.
They didn't hold up your pay, I don't guess. They went ahead and paid you. Yeah, they okay. paid me. Well, thank, <laughs> thank you, Amy. I uh, <coughs> express my appreciation on behalf of the board for the hard work you performed in that campaign. Nobody knows any better than Tom Knight and myself just how hard you did work. And and uh, I, uh, I regret it very much uh, over the fact that we had to string you out all over three districts like we did. Uh, she, she did. I spent a lot of time running from here and yon, uh, primarily in the early stages, trying to get the women groups organized, get the telephone operations set up. Uh, and she did an excellent job. And uh, in each three of the districts, in this respect, uh, she's already touched on uh, uh, several of the problems we had, uh, uh, more in the fourth and fifth than the second. I'd have to agree with her analysis of the thing that we were able in final analysis to get it all together in that second <coughs> district and win the election, and that's what we, what, where we failed in the other two. Uh, we had good cooperation from the campaign <coughs> people. Uh, we had uh, uh, each, uh, you know, they were working hand in glove together. We had the, uh, the women, uh, women working, uh, our own people with we other women groups on the telephone. Uh, we had uh, good cooperation from uh, from our black labor people and with the A. Philip Randolph people. We got it all together in the second district and carried all 16 counties, which to me is an indication that we do have the the troops to get the job done when we put it all together. All right, so much for that, Amy. I just want to let you know that I personally appreciate all the hard work that you put into this thing, and uh, please don't assume the responsibility for having lost. Uh, I can give you any number of reasons and give you any number of people that I consider more responsible than you. We just needed more like you. So the next uh, person on the program who will also elaborate, I think, on uh, on uh, the recent campaign, because he also spent an awful lot of time in each three of the districts, uh, primarily uh, working with the minorities and, uh, and what have you, uh, through the A. Philip Randolph Institute. Uh, that's Bob Woodson, a member of our mm -hmm. board and director of Minority Affairs. Bob, it's yours now. Okay, Carl, thank you. And uh, to the board, I would uh, first like to express my appreciation in behalf of the Phil Randolph Institute for participation and cooperation we received from various local unions throughout the years in which we worked that some of our board members may be affiliated with or had uh, direct influence on participation we did get in our activity. Uh, I think our people worked very diligently uh, where we were working to try and help elect labor candidates. However, you know, we have to play kind of a nonpartisan role when we work under the banner of the AC or Randolph Institute because of <coughs> funding. But uh, more or less, we know how to handle that situation, and we thought we handled it pretty good. We have to wear these different hats at different times, and sometimes we have to hide one under the other. So this is what we did. We hid one hat under the other during the election in the areas where we work, and we did actually try and get the vote out in behalf of the labor endorsed or cope endorsed candidate. We find that we faced quite a few problems. Uh, to our major problems uh, we face is apathy within our community. That's one of them. And the other one we face is the uh, lack of education. Uh, when we talk about education, we can scope it into a broad subject because it not only it deals with education politically, it deals with education in regards to union activity and other community activities. We find that one thing that, that, that's responsible for the apathy that exists, especially among our black union members, is the kind of relationship <coughs> and the kind of participation they have within their local unions, within the community. We think that if the relationship, <coughs> and if the participation within the local union, within their local community would improve, and the local union would help us, 
do an education of God with these people, then this would help eliminate a large extent of our problems. And I ask your help this evening, uh, and wherever you can, to help strengthen and bring about broader cooperation <coughs> and better participation in the relationship within the local union for this purpose. We find that uh, uh, there is still a lot of uh, people in the community, and Tom referred to them as lim lim limousine liberals, that still attempts to destroy the relationship of the coalition that we try and form between the labor movement in the community as a whole. So this is one of the problems that we face. Now, we spent quite a bit of time in the districts, especially the districts where labor had endorsed candidates. Brother Jenkins there were one of the people who were responsible for working with some of the activity we had going on on the coastal area, which was included in the 5th District. Now, we spent <coughs> our participation even into districts where there was not an election this year. We had to do this in order to maintain a relationship with the people for future elections that's coming up in these districts maybe next year a year after next where we still have to de depend on these people to work with us and try and help us elect a candidate who may be endorsed by Coke in that particular district. And at this time, I refer, you know, to the, I believe the second and third district, I believe these are the two districts where we didn't have an election uh, at this time. First, third, first, and first, and first, first and third, first and third, first and third, right. Now, uh, Sister Hollywell spoke of her disappointment <coughs> in candidates in the 4th and 5th District not getting elected in this election. I'm disappointed also, but I'm not going to blame the people in the labor movement. I'm not going to blame the black people. I'm going to blame the candidates themselves. That's who I'm going to blame. Pacific, uh, in this district, I think Senator Bojan may be and I feel strongly that he's responsible for his own defeat in the 4th Congressional District. Now, we look at the district tally. We find and we know that Hines County was the key county to the, the, the candidate winning the election in this district. Okay, we look at the election returns, and we find that in this county, <coughs> where we have some 30-odd uh, 30 predominantly black precincts, we find that Senator Bojan carried all those precincts with the exception of two or three, which may was been carried by Representative Cochran. Now, Mr. McBride was in the race, but I mind you, Mr. McBride received 10,000 votes in the total district. Senator Bojan lost by an excess of 12,000 votes in Hines County. So you can't say that Mr. McBride was responsible for Mr. Bojan losing when he didn't get as many votes in the entire district as Mr. Bojong lost in Hines County. Now, the people in Hines County voted Republican this time. They voted Republican not only for the congressional mm -hmm. candidate, but they voted Republican for the election committee. I think the Hines County Election Commission now is controlled by Republicans. Right. All but one. All but one. And this was done because Senator Bodron made the mistake, and he thought it was a political advantage to him to continue to get on TV and make pictures and scatter them around through the community with Big Jim. Hines County is anti-Jim country, and I think he's responsible for losing the election. And I'm not going to blame myself, and I'm not going to blame <laughs> you either, Abby. <laughs> <laughs> I think the candidate himself, of course, we've gotten some reports at our last Randolph meeting from the activity that went on to some degree in Brother Jenkins' in the area. We feel from the report we got from Brother Jane down there that they worked vigorously to try and elect the candidate. We don't know exactly what happened down there, but we feel that because of uh, certain influential people becoming involved in the Trent Lock campaign who had ties with the uh, coma people around there, and uh, the governor's office here in Jackson was actually responsible for the candidate in that area losing. We are glad that the candidate did win in the uh, uh, second congressional district. Now, another problem we find in 
and dealing with our political situation is we don't have any uniform election law in the state of Mississippi. And, and, and you would be surprised. I heard Amy mention Tom telling her some of the problems that we had here in Hines County on election day. Well, I'm not talking about what nobody told me. I saw these things happen because I was running from precinct to precinct like a jackrabbit all day. And I saw what the Republicans was out there doing. They played some dirty politics in Hines County. And I saw some of the things that, that happened. They, they was breaking all kind of regulation. They had people, and they spent a lot of money. I don't know whether they got it from Mr. Nixon or who. <laughs> But they had these people out there in force on election day at these polling places, breaking all kinds of regula regulations campaigning for them. And I understand that there was a lot of phony business went on downtown in the election commission headquarters and this kind of thing. And, uh, of course, all this could contribute, but I think if we had some type of uniform election law and if we had some type of enforcement, for the weak laws that we do have, it would eliminate a lot of these problems. I think if we grab some of these politicians up and prosecute them for breaking the laws on election day, it will stop this kind of stuff throughout the state. And until we have this kind of stuff in force, we're going to ever have problems. We're going to forever have elections stolen. I don't think there's two counties in the state of Mississippi that vote alike. I don't think there's two counties in the state of Mississippi that even count ballots alike. You know, we use a style of here where they run them through an IBM machine and count. Well, anybody know an IBM or a computer is, does what it's programmed to do. And if you ain't got control of the programmer, you just might be messed up. <laughs> <laughs> so these, these are problems <coughs> to face. Now, we are going to continue our efforts to educate our people. We are continuing to hold meetings monthly throughout the state in some area or another. We talked with uh, some of our people recently in the national office about conducting a series of workshops throughout the state this year. In a lot of areas, we have municipal elections coming up this year. We need to continue to work with our people and try and find what's the most effective way to deal with the problems that we face. We know that we have problems. We know that there, there must be a way somehow or somewhere to deal with these problems, but I, we just have not stumbled up on it yet. And we think that if we keep stumbling, that we might find it. Now, we are like a song that I heard uh, a lady sang the other day about Lord, I don't want you to move the mountain, but just give me the strength to climb it. And I don't want you to move the stumbling blocks, but just leave me around. And that's what we, <laughs> that's, that's what we are asking. We, we, we don't want the mountain out the way, but we want to find a way to conquer the mountain. And that's what we're going to have to keep stumbling until we do. Now, Amy, I want to come in on one other thing you said. You say in the northern area, you had two different kinds of people. I think in Mississippi and everywhere we got three different kinds of people. I think we got people that make things happen. We got people who watch things happen, and we got them that don't excuse me, don't give a damn what happens. <laughs> <laughs> so, so until we can get these people who watch things happen and who don't give a damn about what happened to join with these who make things happen, we're going to continue to have problems. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Very well spoken, uh, Bob. I, I think you analyzed that situation pretty accurately, and and I'm not going to take a lot of time. I just want to simply say this. Brother Knight's got a word he wants to say, and then we'll get to the other reports. And <coughs> Brother Tun, I wish you'd bring your chair and come up here and sit with Brother Jenkins and Bob Kyle, because we don't know what three of you to get together on that fast school program directly. Right. Y'all might want to get your heads together a little bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It gets down to this, it gets down to this, uh, uh, without uh, a whole lot of words. In the second district where we were successful, we had a good, attractive candidate who appealed to our people.
where we had no problems in trying to get our people turned on to vote and support for the candidate. We had that for us going for us. And we did have in that district good people running the candidate's campaign who was willing to roll up their sleeves and go to work with us, with our people, no problems whatsoever. We had good leadership on the part of the labor movement in that district. And the record indicates we put it all together and we had a winner. Now we can take the fourth and the fifth and discuss all the problems, but we didn't have the combination and those two districts that we had in the second and we lost. I personally feel that had Walter Brown been the nominee instead of Ellis Bodron, that we would have beat Thad Cochran because he's young and attractive. Uh, Ellis, of course, is blind and he's got some scars by virtue of the fact he's been in the state senate for a number of years. He's incurred some enemies. We had that load to carry. But Amy, I think, and Bob have done an excellent job of putting the onus where it belongs. It wasn't our fault that either one of these two candidates lost. Uh, I think that each one of them will tell you that we went the extra mile with them. Ellis Bodron himself will tell you, had it not been for the trade union movement, there would have been very little done in his district. And I'm sure that Ben Stone will tell you the same thing. I know, and Tom Knight knows, that the labor movement provided the manpower and some money and did most of the doggone legwork in all three of the districts. You take us out of it, there's been very little done. All right, Tom, it's yours. I don't want Just a few minutes before we get into other reports. I want to mention a couple of things here pertaining to the fourth and fifth <coughs> district. Brother Woodson mentioned the Hines County. It's true. They saw, they analyzed the first and second primary, and they saw the, the, the Cochran people, you know, the Republicans, that Hines County itself had almost 50% of the votes cast in the 4th District. Now, it was simple. They knew that if they stole Hines County, they'd win this election. That's exactly what they'd done. Now, Bob mentioned some hanky-panky that went on down at the courthouse in the basement where all the boxes are kept where the election commission's uh, material and equipment's kept. It just so happened that an employee of the Hines County Republican Party, now a full-time staff person of the Republican Party in Hines County, wound up some way with a key, now get this, with a key to the only door that went in to the election commissioner's head, election commission headquarters in the Hines County Courthouse. Now let's see what they've done with that key. Just as soon as the, the, the precinct officials were designated, they had all the time in the world they wanted to get lists, a complete list of every precinct worker and get out there and do the necessary homework to make sure that that precinct worker was well under their control and the results will show that they've done one whale of a good job. For instance, about 3 o'clock that afternoon on Election Day, Precinct 76 down at Level Woods Community Center, below where I live, there was a man went in there to vote. He didn't ask for any help. Now, let's back up just a minute. Mind you, that in all three districts, they deliberately told half-truths, outright lies, to the rank-and-file voter about whether or not you could split a ticket. People were really concerned about it. It's, it's evident by the vote. Everybody that wanted to vote for Nixon here about it. But they seemed inclined to want to vote Democratic for the other officers, you see. So the Republican Party laid the proper groundwork, you see, to create a certain amount of confusion unlike we've never had before, even people that had voted in a number of elections, not to mention the new vote. All right, people, more people than ever before went in asking for assistance. This man went in Precinct 76, didn't ask for no assistance, and I want you to know one of the managers forced himself in the booth with him and marked his ballot before he could stop it. Republican all the way down. And the man raised so much hell until they throwed the ballot out and gave him another ballot. Now, where he raised heck for his own rights and in his own behalf and got something done about it, how many hundreds of thousands of voters in Hines County that day let them put that hogwash on them, see? 
I mean, they marked his ballot all the way down Republican. Another election worker was heard tell a party that if they, they said they wanted some help, she says, if you're going to vote for the president, I'll help you. If you don't, I don't have time. I wish to God she'd have told me that, whoever it was. You see? And every time that they went to show a, a, a voter how to vote, you know, there was four slates <coughs> of presidential electors on the ballot. They used the Republican slate as the illustration. They says, now, I don't know how many reports come in. They say, now, you got to mark, you got to point this, all seven of these. They never, nobody that anybody knows used the Democratic presidential elector slate as an example. See? Oh, they was well schooled. And how did they get the list? They stole it out of the far, Hines County Courthouse. That's how they got it. There ain't no telling it for thousands of dollars just to be perfectly frank about it, that it cost them to get that job done. But they stole this district right here in Hines County. We can go on all day. Forget about that. I, one thing I want to mention down in in, uh, in uh, uh, Fifth District. It really, really bothered me. And it, it really bothered me worse that nothing was attempted uh, uh, in the, the way of trying to correct it. On Monday night, the election was the next Tuesday. I attended a Forest County meeting for Stone in Harrisburg. And after that meeting was over, <coughs> there was a person who walked up to me and told me they wanted to talk to him. So we had a cup of coffee, and this person showed me a letter that had just been received by a preacher in Harrisburg that uh, I happen to know, Claude knows it. Uh, and he was an ardent Stone supporter saw that this letter got back to the Stone people right away because he could knew immediately what it was going to do. This letter was addressed to the University of Baptist Church attention pastor. No preacher's name on it. I assume every one in the 5th district went out in that fact. Inside that envelope was a, a tabloid about like this. And at the top of that was a photostatic copy of the license of a liquor <laughs> store in Biloxi, Michigan. And it showed the names of the three people to whom the license were issued. Two men and a woman. And that woman was Nancy Stone. And they used a black flare point pen, which writes a D line. Opposite that in handwriting, Mrs. Ben Stone. And then below that was a series of measures introduced in the state senate by Ben Stone. And uh, two of them had to do with the licensing and regulation of state liquor stores. And they had that circle, those two Senate bill numbers with that same pen, you see. Now, every preacher in the 5th District got one of them. Now, there is, that was right there, the Nancy Stone. There was one of the owners, one of the last knees of that liquor store, but it was entirely a different Nancy Stone to Ben Stone's life. And I said to this party, I says, my God, you're going to do something about this. We got to talk to Ben. There wasn't one confounded thing done to straighten that out. I had two people in that district tell me the next Sunday. You see, they got it out so everybody had it on Sunday before the election. I had two people tell me, two of our workers, that told me that at least Ten or twelve people in their church walked up to them after church. Now, it wasn't mentioned from the pulpit in these two particular churches, but it already got around to them. At least a dozen people walked up to them and said, Well, I was going to vote for Ben Stone, but since his wife's part owner of a liquor store in Biloxi, I'm voting for Lot. Now, there wasn't a confounded thing done to try to, <coughs> to correct this rumor, to stamp this thing out. So how in the heck you going to help somebody like that? And then one other thing. Bob mentioned Jim Eason. Jim Eason hurt Ellis Bodron and Ben Stone more than we'll ever know. Down in the 5th District, these people know better than I. There was Ben Stone stickers, uh, stubs and yards all over that place till Monday afternoon. And every one of them the next morning been replaced with Trent Lott's picture. Why was Jim Eason up holding up one hand, bragging on the president, 
he's going to be reelected, I'm going to be reelected, and then turn around and ask the people to vote Democratic, you know? There had to be a payoff. He had to pay <coughs> Richard Dick and them off somewhere, so they simply paid off by switching over. And I'm sure a lot of that happened in the 4th District. So the great president pro tem of the Senate certainly did his part in defeating Ben Stone and Ellen Bogart. Okay. We could talk all night. We can spend the rest of the day on this subject. I suggest that we not, uh, that we just simply get ourselves together and keep our powder dry, and there's going to be another day, and they won't have Vincent Stokehills to ride, and Jim Eastman won't be running, and so forth, and uh, we'll be ready. Jim, let me ask one question. Do you think when we evaluate these people such as we did, don't you think we ought to look at people like Bodron and Brown and evaluate better than what we did with a young man as Brown was? I mean, in the future, we ought to learn from our lessons very much so. I don't know, Bob. This was an unusual situation. Well, I mean, it, I know this yeah. one was, but in the future... It's an unusual situation. Of course, I guess we had what you consider good problems for a change, wherein... And most of the races, we had a number of friends in each one we of them. We were enthused with our uh, problems that we had. I right. Know we and uh, this is a situation we found ourselves <laughs> in in the poor. Uh, the fact we had two good friends in the state legislature and a runoff in the primary. And uh, we were in this position, especially with Bodron, more than would, would have been with Brown, I think. Uh, concerning the fact that Bodron uh, is chairman of uh, one of the very important committees in the Senate, the Finance Committee, who has an awful lot of influence over there, uh, had we, uh, you know, opposed Bodron, in face of his past voting record, he voted against right to work, uh, you know, one of the few guys that did. And they've been pretty hard to justify opposing uh, uh, Bodron and supporting Brown, but had we done that, then we'd have still had to live with Ennis Bodron as a member of the Senate, you know. That that was in the picture, you know, well, in this I, thing I, I, I as well. That. I mean, uh, we had to think about that. Uh, the decision in the fifth was not that tough because well, the other guy uh, uh, was not in the legislature. In the second, the choice was real easy up there between uh, uh, Bowen and uh, what was his name? The Cook. Cook. No problems there, but the problem in the fourth, hopefully we don't have any more of them cars. Uh, you know, we just took a neutral position in the runoff and both and well, run won it by about a thousand votes. Uh, uh, I still think that if Brown would have been the nominee, he would have probably had a winner because he was the more attractive candidate. I'll tell you one thing, you wouldn't have to look for Brown and Jackson. You wouldn't have to look for yeah. your campaign manager because they'd have yeah. been knocking on your door. We had well, to, I know. This lady come down, we in our local union hall, we couldn't even find out who the manager was. We yeah. were begging for literature, and we finally found somebody about two days before the election. Yeah. We were begging. We couldn't find out who it was. Right. Then. Well, it's So it's what we did, we did it on our own. I mean, it's... Yeah. it's well, it's just one of those tough things to deal with. I think that the system we use is about as good as you're going to come up with. Uh, that four-point evaluation system we've got, properly used and applied, I don't think it can be much improved upon. It's just one of those situations uh, that you uh, seldom find, I guess, is where you've got two good friends uh, well, I got one more observation I want you to think about, and Bob's gone. We need a Randolph Institute down there because we got some black leaders down there still very popular. Well, I'm sure he'll be back. He has the left. And, and we need a Randolph him. Institution down there worse than any other section of the state because we well, still I, I got the mayor of Fayette down there who's still very popular with a lot of people. He's not in some parts of the state, but he's still very popular down in southwest Mississippi. Well, I'll give um, Bob the names and addresses of several of your black uh, labor people, including several members of your local. And well, we've had our, and from my local union, when they had this yeah. meeting up here, we've had them, but we need a Randolph Institute. I think you ought to have Mississippi one. Mississippi worth anywhere else. Why don't you uh, talk with him uh, right. when the meeting's over? With I'm sure he just went to the restroom, didn't he? Herbert? The telephone. I telephone? I'm right. sure it'd be well, back. Well, the mayor Fayette is still popular down there, yeah. whether anybody wants to agree with him or not. I mean, well, uh, we'll, uh, you talk to Bob about this. Mr. Chairman, could yes. I say just one word on yes. this general subject? Coming from one of the districts that one did win. 
We right. haven't been in it from, it, from mm -hmm. the very beginning on up until the uh, whistle right. blew. Uh, if you recall, and I'm not going to a, a lot of detail, right. but all of these counties making up that district had a labor representative appointed right. to represent labor in that county. Uh, as far as I know, every county, uh, D David Bowen had a campaign manager. Right. Now, I'm not sure that all of, all over these several counties that there was close cooperation between our man and his man, but as far as I know, there was contact and cooperation and a concerted effort. It was welcome to start with on their part. Right. And, they, and consequently, we were on the inner councils, we were right. brought into consideration, we attended the dinners, we participated in it, we attended the rallies when they were in reach. Right. Uh, now it seems to me that that has to be done in that <coughs> fashion or something along that line, not because uh, that combination won in that particular situation, but I believe that there has to be some coordination and cooperation between our people and, no and their people. About it. No question about it. Uh, and that brings me to say this, that a lot, uh, maybe we need to do this uh, earlier and do uh, maybe a little bit more careful on who our people are in some cases. Somebody, mm -hmm. not because he's a good Joe, but because he will get out there and work at it some. Mm -hmm. Besides that, I'm going to have to say, too, that he needs, actually, if, it, if you can arrange it in a way and get a hold of it, that particular representative needs a little money <coughs> that he can spend at his discretion mm -hmm. because when he meets with his group in that county he and they're talking about ways and means radio spot announcements mm -hmm. or this thing and that thing he need uh, uh, plates for dinners and so on he needs to be able to say okay I can do this I can do that I can't do this that's the only way that he's going to get recognized and get get brought into the picture act, uh, actively. He's going to have to be out there somewhat on the same basis that the, uh, his counterpart is, that is, the, uh, the county manager for the candidate. Now, uh, there's still the money proposition, but that is going to, we're going to have to look a little earlier, work it a little bit closer, and work it along that line. It might be that in the second district, uh, two years from now, we could come up with a uh, district hope organization. I don't know where it would do any better. It, it, it's doing pretty good as it is. Right. That might not help. But uh, that, that's my, some of my observations after having gone through this thing in this campaign. Very good, Brother Taylor. I, uh, you can't argue with success, that's for sure. <coughs> yeah, I'm to the second district and I think that uh, just had to say this that Amy and Robert both did a, a good job uh, I want to express our appreciation for what you did up in our district I know you worked hard up there and uh, I'm sure Rob did too and uh, we uh, we needed all the help we could uh, yes uh, well I knew something else I wanted to say and I thought uh, you <laughs> uh, I understand, in fact, uh, I got one myself, and I understand quite a few others did. I got, got an uh, invitation from uh, Mr. Bowen to attend his reception up in Washington, and I thought it was real nice, although I couldn't attend, and I know. Uh, my wife called me and told me it was the same that says it on the 5th, and I said, well, I don't know what I'm going to the board meeting and going to Washington. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I got home and it was a third and I done missed it. <laughs> well, that's a good souvenir anyway. You know, that's right. <laughs> well, let me, present. let me say this uh, uh, in connection with the second district before it slipped from my mind. Uh, uh, one of his key workers, Mr. Franks, uh, in North Jax, Jax over in the uh, Cleveland area, I believe, called me yesterday and wants to meet with Tom and myself Wednesday. I understand they've got quite a campaign deficit. That's what they're going to want to talk about, see if there's any ways and means we can help raise some money to have to pay it off. So you might not have heard the last of the second district up there, even though we've won the thing. They might be calling on to help raise some money to help pay off the deficit. Uh, we will keep you properly informed on that. <laughs> now, you said you wanted to... 
Uh, I'd like to go along with Brother Taylor and Brother Orman and thank Mr. Hollowell for what she did for us down in Central Lake Council of Greenville. I think she did do a very good job down there, although she didn't get to spend too much time with us. We do appreciate what she done down there, and we were really glad to have her down there. I know she feels good now, Amy. Mm -hmm. You feel Don't real you feel good. good now. <laughs> All the plaudits she was getting. Well, she really worked hard. I'll say that for her. Can we leave that now and get into the other reports? Uh, we've got <coughs> we've got two particular programs uh, going on in the state now. That most of the board uh, are familiar with. Some of the newer board members might not too be too familiar with uh, with those programs. One of them is in Pascagoula, the National of Litton Industries, uh, where we have the so-called Shipyard of the Future, uh, where the state voted a hundred thirty million dollars worth of bonds to build a thing, and then we. Uh, Letting Industries top officials come in, the first thing they attempted to do was to bust the unions. And we had a hell of a fight down there for a couple of years, uh, letting them know we weren't going to roll over and play dead. I spent an awful lot of time in that town over a couple of year period. And in the process of all of this, uh, uh, we were able to get a program set up <coughs> uh, tying in with the manpower training needs of Letton primarily designed to recruit minorities for the uh, shipyard, the apprenticeship programs and what have you. That program now, I think, is, what is, how old is it now, John? About uh, yeah, around two years, years right close to exactly. two years old. Uh, some of you, your board members might not have seen this uh, July 71 issue of the Federation. It's, we mailed it to the members uh, last year. Any of your new members haven't seen this? Hold up your hand, I'll send a copy down. Now, some of you didn't get this. How many? Uh, you hadn't got one, I don't think, Bob. Yeah, we we'll get some in the office. Did you get it? Yeah. Anybody else? Got yeah, a special story in there on the past school of programs, really not asking you. A Rex artist who wrote the story. You want one, Herbert? Yeah. Pass one down to Herbert. Anybody else? The rest of you seen it? Brother Orman? I get one once in a while. Well, that's the 71 issue. That's, uh, I got some extra copies and mail each member of the board uh, back when it come out, that uh, issue. But it's now uh, better than a year old, uh, as you can see. And uh, I thought I'd bring a few copies along for the benefit of those of you that didn't see the story. There's a story in there on the past to go to program. Rex Hardy, to see, the uh, associate editor of the Federationist, met me in Pascagoula, and I spent a, a couple of days with him and went over the program. He went back to Washington and wrote that story. And I think it's a very good story. Uh, uh, it's primarily about the Pascagoula program. Of course, you'll find some other things in there, but the guts of it is on the Pascagoula program. Well, now, that program is almost two years old now. Uh, we've got two federal funded groups involved in it. Uh, one of them is HRDI, which is an AFL-CO-sponsored manpower training program. And the other one is also a federal-funded program sponsored by the A. Philip Randolph Institute, uh, who recently changed its name to RTP. Uh, but the program is, is tied together with both programs, working in coordination with one another. Uh, we've had some problems in the past with it. And I'm happy to report here today that, in my opinion, the program is moving real fine today. Uh, I think they've been able to help cut down on the turnover at the Litton Shipyard. Uh, in addition to uh, recruiting people and training them and so forth, they're also making union members out of them. Nobody gets through that program without signing a union card. That's the first thing I understand, uh, Bob, that you do is you talk to them about signing a union card. And uh, <coughs> things are looking real good. I was down in Pascagoula uh, about a week before Christmas, I think it was. Uh, we had a meeting down there with the Litton uh, management people. And everybody associated with the programs came in. And we had, in my opinion, a real productive meeting. The company has uh, made a complete circle, in my opinion, again. Brother Kelly and Brother Tunney can uh, dispute this, I guess, if they see fit. 
But I feel that that was a very productive meeting, the last meeting we had. The company now is uh, working in cooperation with the program. <coughs> I think there's going to be a lot of good result from it. And uh, <coughs> that uh, we will <coughs> be able to build <coughs> ships and save our $130 million. I was really worried about that $130 million for a while. We have a young man with us today who is now the director of the RTP program, Mr. Robert Kyle, who is also a member of the Machinist Union. We also have John Jenkins, the business agent of the Laborers Union, uh, who uh, consented to spend as much time as he could with the Pascula program, and at one time actually directed it, uh, but couldn't spend enough time so he relinquished the thing to eventually the Robert Cod. You might remember Bob Thomas. He was associated with it for a while, and and he had to leave, and then uh, eventually Bob Kyle took his place. Now, we have Brother Turner, Brother Kyle, and Brother Jenkins, all three here, who are directly associated with the program, and I'm going to ask the three of them uh, to give us a report on that Pascadula program. We don't want you to spend the rest of the afternoon, but we do want the board to know what you got going on down there. Who wants to start it off? So the Kyle? Well, anyway, uh, I think, uh, I don't know, don't ask me how these machinists wind up uh, with all of the jobs in these programs. Now, before you start, I'm out to say this, you see, we went down there trying to find people to get in the program. And if you know something, we got, uh, we got uh, C.B. Turner out of the machinist to run an HRDI program. Robert Kyle out of the machinist lo ro local running the uh, RTP program. And working with him is another machinist by the name of Shorty Cornell acting out there in the field of recruiting. So it looks like the machinist has pretty well got a monopoly on the program <coughs> in high school. I don't know how they managed to let John Jenkins sneak in on this, John, but I think you ought to start raising a little sand. I think we was in on it from the outset. <coughs> you know, we was they rooted you out. They rooted us out. Okay, Bob, go ahead. Well, I just uh, had to have that uh, little with, comment. With the machinists, I think that that uh, can go back and say that we have a very outstanding business agent now. That's you got uh, one knows how to talk, I can tell you right, that. Right, and uh, I think that will contribute to the fact that we uh, we rule the program. Uh, I, I think you've told everybody how basically the program got started. And, uh, uh, we, ha we have been in existence for 21 months. I want to come around here where you can look at that, folks. I might want to throw a question at you, right? <laughs> but anyway, uh, we've been in existence for 21 months for uh, a long period of time. Uh, company at, at uh, say, a couple of years, uh, at least for 15 months of the uh, existence of the program, the company looked upon us as being a union within ourselves, and at this time they were fighting the union, and uh, of course they were fighting us too. And uh, now that the company has realized that they cannot break the union, they cannot beat the union, that we have won over them. Uh, they have accepted the union. Uh, they have said they accept them anyway. Uh, that means they have accepted our program. We are doing, uh, we are doing real good uh, for the company. And uh, of course, the results from this meeting we had uh, last month, we proved to the company that we had the expertise to to do for them what they were spending fifty thousand dollars a year trying to do and uh, was not doing. And uh, this list, I think, uh, everybody uh, might have a copy of it. It's a complete breakdown of uh, what we have done uh, thus far. <coughs> These figures are figures that now exist that, that are still in the shipyard. Of course, we have had a turnover problem, not that much of a problem. Uh, out of the 662 people, we have lost probably 156, I think. That figure uh, does not appear on here. We are basically concerned with the apprenticeship program. Uh, we put 91 apprentices in there uh, from the conception of the program until September 1 of last year. We lost a few of those apprentices due to the fact that we were not able to follow up on the apprentices. Uh, they would fire the apprentices or get rid of them and have a problem. 
we wouldn't know anything about it until six weeks later, and at that time, uh, the guy is too far gone to try to bring him back. Now the company <coughs> has accepted us, and we are working with the company. They are uh, participating with us in any way possible, and uh, so far this year, of uh, since September 1 to this day, we have put 36 apprentices into the program, and we had not lost one yet. So uh, I think that that's a, a big asset uh, to the company. We uh, we try to work together, and of course, this uh, not only with RTP, but of course with HRDI too. We're working hand in hand, and they contribute to us uh, a great percentage of our placements and being able to keep the people there. Thank you, Bob. Very good. You think the meeting we had then was real productive, right? The last meeting? Well, uh, we was encouraged with the attitude and so forth. We can say that we've gotten, um, got more done in 30 days than we did in six months before the meeting. Yeah. Right, good. I, I'd hope that. Uh, I felt the same way. I'm happy to hear that. Okay, uh, John, you want to comment? It, and then we'll let yes, Senator I'd like to have one. All right. You know, maybe <laughs> go John back. Jenkins. Right, here with John, I might say, uh, John and Russell Kelly. Uh, see if there's anybody else here from down there. No, I believe John and Russell are two people present that we're in on the very beginning of this whole program. Uh, Gunner came on board after we got it set up, but he wasn't there in the head knocking stages when we got it on the road. But John Jenkins and Russell Kelly were in on every inch of the way, so we'll let John come in a few minutes. All right, well, I'd like to go back and talk about a few of the other things that uh, Bob here has mentioned. That we wasn't getting cooperation of the company when this program was first established. For a long time, we've had problems simply because the company knows that every young man that came into our office or was interested in the apprenticeship pro program, if we got him on the job, that man was a union member. That, that was our primary objective, was to get, make the man become a union member. So after he was into the program, on the job, we would assure him, well, you know, we don't have any contractual ob obligation with the company. We can't file a grievance for you, but we want you to become a member of that particular union, whichever trade you choose to go in, so that we can call on that business agent for representation if if you got a legitimate grievance or if you've been fired or kicked out for any reason. So the company, for that reason, the company, uh, that was a communication gap. They failed to cooperate with us uh, for approximately 18 months. It took about 18 months for them uh, finally to make up in their mind that they it was no way possible for them to kick the union out of the shipyard. It was said by one of the labor relations representatives that they had approximately a million dollars to spend to bust the union, the metal trade town. It was going to kick all 13 of the unions out. So they tried that. They wind up uh, almost losing the contract, uh, wind up with our people on the street for several days down there. And I'm sure that all read about it. Of course, we've had uh, Mr. Ramsey here to spend a great deal of time in there trying to help us get out of that situation. So now we've got a, uh, we had to break the five-year contract. We went into negotiations a bit early. We've gotten that all behind us. We've got a new contract. Uh, now the company has decided that they are willing to cooperate with the various uh, with the outreach program, both HRDI and uh, RTP. And now, look, well, it looks to me like that the company is willing to cooperate. We are making, uh, <coughs> we have cleared up the lines of communication. We don't have to go into labor relations office and sit down for an hour and a half where in the past we had to, if we've got a problem, we can walk on in the office and sit down and laid a problem on the table. We've had, we've experienced several different things where apprentices were fired on the job by the supervisor without the approval of the apprenticeship committee. 
problem like this, we can take them directly up with labor relations and they'll reinstate the guy. And in one case, I think we've got coming up here where the uh, young fella is going to get back pay, retroactive pay, from the date that he was discharged by the supervisor. So we, we, we're getting all kind of cooperation. We're getting the cooperation from uh, top management now. And I think that we uh, maybe perhaps uh, next year this time we'll be able to double our plate. We played something. These these are the actual figures. Here. This 662 is what we've got in the shipyard now. Uh, of course, we've lost about 100, uh, 150 guys, but they they wasn't our indentured apprentices. These was guys either in labor job or help apprentice category. So these are the true figures. So with that, I'll turn it over and let uh, Mr. Turner have it. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Okay, I ain't gonna take too long for all three reasons. You know, talk politics, and I done got me mad again about all that mess. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I don't know. Uh, every time you mention Litany, puts a bad taste in your mouth because we've had so many problems with them <coughs> to our job. Uh, one of the reasons that they did finally come around to seeing the uh, labor's point of view down there, I've been able to stop uh, about a million dollars worth of fun what is uh, training people in National Alliance of Business and Training Program. So we got their attention that way. And uh, <laughs> they, they have been <coughs> deal now for now the last uh, year or so, and we can't communicate. For a while, uh, we couldn't even communicate at all. We couldn't help them, and, uh, but everything is moving along pretty good. I am funded by the Department of Labor, and uh, I am the manpower arm of AFL-CIO. My contract's up in to the day four, 13 days. We don't have a new contract yet. So I'm going to borrow time right now. And, uh, but I think we get refunded. Uh, in my contract, in a one-man office, I am supposed to develop 300 jobs a year. This was from last January 17th to this January 17th. I have developed better than 3,000 jobs through the efforts of the union. Every union down there cooperates very well with me, and uh, I'm in, in and out of their offices every day. Except Russell Kelly, he rides with me. I don't have to talk to him too much. <laughs> uh, under this job development, like I said, supposed to uh, develop 300, got better than 3,000. On the job placement, my commitment was 150. As of this week, I placed over 300 in meaningful jobs to come through that office. Now, another thing, we were committed by the Department of Labor to uh, develop a prison program in each state, in all 50 states. Well, I met with the prison board at Parchman and uh, several times and have really established a relationship. And I have uh, sponsored and signed for, at this time, 31 prisons. And they're working all except two. One we can't find, came last week, and we haven't been able to find him. <laughs> <laughs> He's missing an action, and we had one that decided that he wanted to go to Meridian. He didn't ask anybody, and he just left past the blue went to Meridian. We had a job making three dollars and a half an hour to sheet metal work, and Robert and them even loaned him some money to buy his tools and everything. So he he just skipped out on it. But anyway, we got the biggest part of them has done real well, and we're proud of our prison program. And um, I think it's uh, by the end of this contract, I should have 35 prisoners placed. So that's about three <coughs> times above what I was supposed to. I was supposed to place 10, and I'm going to be about 35. And this has received a uh, good deal of credit through the Department of Labor Administration. It's better than you mean about it. Another thing, I have done some follow up on these 300 people that we placed in the shipyard. And uh, I don't know, it took 100. Sixty-seven of them are still working. So I don't know if that's good or bad, but that's I've got sixty-seven out of hundred that's still alive. Good good. Very good. Hey, listen, you the governor the head of your way got a good turnaround. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I thought you people would be interested in uh, and hearing from these people because you uh, all of the taxpayers in this state have a 
stake in that situation down there, and uh, it looks like <coughs> for a long time that, that we might have $130 million worth of junk sitting out there on that, on that Gulf uh, Coast. And I told I had to get pretty hard-nosed and mean in the course of all of this. Uh, uh, I didn't see any other way to handle it. And I just had to tell some of the top people down there on a couple of occasions that I'd see them all go dead in hell and not the shipyard rust down before we had a non-union shipyard in the city of Pascagoula. And at one time I threatened to call up Senator Maine and Senator Muskie and uh, in the state of Maine and tell them they could have that damn shipyard, you know. That's, uh, that's the way we had to talk to them people. But uh, the statement made by John, I believe it was, about the fact they made the brags they had a million dollars to bust the union with wasn't no idle statement. It was actually made. And uh, those people uh, pulled up their bikes and took them on. We had a wildcat strike down there, uh, shut the whole works down. And without getting into a long rigmarole about it all, we wound up getting them food stamps and unemployment insurance and the whole business, you know, and that taught them one lesson. But I'm very proud of them people down there. When the chips got out, you know, and the big blue chips is on the table, they come through. And I'm happy to know, and I know you are, that the labor movement in Jackson County and Lytton Industries especially is there, it's alive, and they're making real progress. And they are going to build a ship to the float that they can sell and pay off the $130 million acre job. A long time ago, I had my doubts about whether them damn ships were food or not <laughs> there when they would go down there and hear some of that malarkey putting out. Okay, okay, fellas. Uh, we'll let the guys uh, talk to you later if they want to. Anybody got any questions? But next we're going to get Brother Dee's report, and then we'll have a little question and answer and see if they might want to throw something all at you. Yeah, Russell. <laughs> We yeah, put it all on the tape now. Both of you are very respectful when the people come out of these offices. Like right. The members. I don't think like you should be put in a minute, so I want you to make a page respect for that. Well, we'll, uh, we'll edit them real close before she puts them in final print. Uh, the printed <laughs> copy, of course, it, it'll be on the tape, but we keep that locked up anyhow. Uh, bro, we're going to, we got a, we got another gentleman present who uh, is a former member of this board, Brother S.H. Dees, who I think most of you know, especially those of you who's been on the board for any length of time. But uh, last year, I was approached by some people associated with another federal funded program known as the Appalachian Council. Uh, which is another manpower training program of sorts. At that particular time, they had been approached by the Choctaw Nation over at Philadelphia by getting a pre-apprenticeship training program in. They had gone to the Appalachian Council. They in turn made contact with me, and we had a couple of sessions. Uh, and I in turn uh, determined that they had money enough to put another man on their staff and bring that program into Mississippi. And I found Brother S.H.D.'s up in Wisconsin on a construction job uh, and talked to him about it a little bit. So he and his wife had a huddle, I understand, and uh, the weather was pretty bad up there and the snow was pretty deep. And even though he, was, <laughs> he had to take a reduction in pay, he decided he'd like to come south and, and come back to Mississippi. So he went on the payroll of the Appalachian <laughs> Council and uh, he's got a number of projects uh, uh, in progress, another in a few uh, more in the making, and he's looking for some prospective customers, probably. So at this point, I'm going to ask Brother Deeds if he'd like to have a few remarks to make. Thank a report, in other words. Most of you I've talked with you on the Appalachian Council Manpower Training, so I won't cut mine short. <coughs>
And I thought it was all a complete flop. It was all a mess. Until recently, I was talking, oh, it may have been a month or two ago, Brother Bass, Bill Bass Parker, David's manager from uh, Korea, and he said that he was getting some satisfaction in the place they didn't come out yet. No good. So uh, I thought that there may be one thing to come out of it. Where anything else did not, I didn't think anything had come out of it. Just a lot of hard words against labor. I was accused instead of trying to coordinate a program out there of organizing. And uh, of course, I wouldn't try to organize anything. We'd organize labor. Uh, uh, we have we have two programs. One with the consolidated aluminum and IU from Mississippi, and one with Daybright Electric. Personally, Mike mentioned that's the plant that Joe Davis is from. Yeah. Daybright uh, plant. Personally, uh, after being on the program for a good while and learning a little bit more about it, and I feel like that if all organized labor would give me a chance to sit down and talk to them individually over their plant their contractors, that is one of the best things that's ever hit the state of Mississippi to organize and to fight non-union contractors and non-union workers. I try to go in when I go into the personnel or the plant manager, the first thing I tell him I'm there is to sit across the table from him like I have done lots of people in negotiations, where I would ask for all the frames benefits I could get, now I'm here to offer you some frames benefits. to have, or I want to have, the commission or consent of the local <coughs> union that has an agreement with us before I go in and talk to them. I think it's one thing that they can use is they will see the man that they handle their grievances with and show them one of our brochures that this man would like to come in and explain the program to you. Well, we got something to offer you instead of asking you for all the fringe benefits that we need. And if any of you here will go back to your heirs and talk to the different various local unions, if they're interested, if you want to contact me or the Mississippi FLCI office, I'll be glad to meet with them and explain it, see if they want to go to their plant or construction company with the contract. We uh, got a good bit more money that we can turn loose in Mississippi for this year. Contract will be out November 15th of 73. And uh, if we don't use the money we have been allocated to Mississippi, pretty soon they're going to be taking it to something in other states and they are going to spend the money. Alabama has spent theirs up to 90 days. That's the new contract for them. That's what I was told. Uh, Bring it down to real, just free facts. It's just the money that we can pay the contractors. He's so mad mine too, he can refer it back to the local union if they want to be responsible for the train. Or the company to help the train people. It's just a gift of money that we can give to the mighty little paperwork system. I've been working as best as I could through the Mississippi FLC office. And I have my own reservations of what was wrong in this last political campaign. I tried to work some on what I could. So I'm not going to get into that. It's, we get lost. That's all I'm saying. We'll try to do better now. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Brother Dees. Uh, we got a few minutes now before the coffee break, which I think would be appropriate for a question and answer session. Anybody got a question they'd like to throw at uh, Brother Dees and the groups up here that's reported on the manpower training programs, especially? Brother Dees is in this kind of a position. It might be well for you folks to give uh, a lot of thought to the program that he's got especially. He's in a different position from the uh, <coughs> other two programs up there, people running the other, well, the program. There's two different agencies involved. But he's in this kind of position, you see. The difference between the two is that he's actually got money. Uh, made available by the Appalachian Council that he can spend 
that he can help you develop uh, with your employer uh, on a manpower training program. And as a matter of fact, to put it very simply, it says that, uh, that we're in a position now as, as to give an employer something instead of asking something of it. Now, there's one strict rule that we adhere to in this program. And it is that we don't set up any program for a non-union employer. It has to be an organized plant. The program has to meet the approval of the local union. Now, you might want to think about what he said, all of you, uh, that this might be a program uh, worth you thinking about and approaching your employer about and calling them in and seeing what can be set up. Uh, We've got to get uh, a few more things going in order to keep the program going and, and keeping the money coming. Like he said, you know, if we don't get it, somebody else will. Uh, he's done a good job up to the point that considering the time uh, that he's had to work on it. Unfortunately, the Choctaw Indian thing that we started out with uh, turned into be more or less a flop because we had a non-union contractor calling all the shots on the reservation and uh, it became apparent before we got too far along that all he was interested in was us helping him and uh, training some jack leg mechanics uh, to do work on the Indian reservation. And I, I made it clear, you talk about, you made it clear, if they got any bones to think, well, anybody, it's me. I told him in no uncertain fashion in meeting after meeting that if we hadn't a thing to do with that program, it had to be organized. And we had to have the cooperation and the assistance of the various building trade unions. And any apprenticeship program we developed had to be developed through the bona fide program. Well, that apparently didn't set good. And after that first initial funding on the pre-apprenticeship program, that was it. But at least we got these on the payroll. And he's now been able to get out and develop a few other programs. He's in a good position now to help a lot of our local unions around the state to set up training programs without you guys. You guys got too much money now with letting, you know, we're going to have to exclude letting from this. Well, he'll tell you, man, he, he'll never get, you never get anywhere with letting, would he? But there's another, there's another aspect of this program that, uh, that hopefully we'll have some more money uh, later on, these, and that's the upgrading thing. Uh, we only got a couple of building tradesmen here on the board, uh, but you've talked about that, I know, with most of the building trades, about the, the, the aspect when we get enough money, more money, to put this upgrading thing in for us. Let me, uh, Sheriff, think a little more to the board about our top five. Yeah. Uh, this institutional pre-apprenticeship training Yeah. going Completion of that, these three crowds would be put in a bona fide indentured apprenticeship program. Right. And uh, I was trying to get that ready to take over when eight weeks was up. Mm -hmm. Well, to do that, I had to meet with the three crowds, business managers, to get them knowing what was happening, to meet with the chief and his board. That's when he said I was trying to organize. I wasn't then, why we wasn't going to do it. Let then, work organized. Then when the council, AFL to Appalachian Council, seen that they wasn't going to cooperate to go into that, we had a good excuse to cancel out. It had been canceled out. But HUD didn't prepare or didn't provide the money in time to start the on-the-job training. So the council just canceled the rest of the program out. It had a lot of potential, and if we hadn't had that non-union scab contract in the picture, I think things have been quite different. I, I regret. Maybe one of these days we'll get it going like it ought to be, but uh, we wasn't about to go in there and set up a non-union program. I, I'd like to say <coughs> a little bit more about the National Alliance of Business Training Program. Well, what the G is the offer of pre-apprenticeship training, the National Alliance of Businessman Training Program uh, trains disadvantaged people. It takes black or white, rich or poor, uh, disadvantage. He may be a high school graduate, but he can't get a job. He don't have no training. 
you can get a nice life business training <coughs> program in your plant, and uh, the federal government will pay for the training. And it's union sponsored. If the union don't want it, you don't. You, they don't get it. Cause I think that it will never be funded. And uh, it's, it's a wonderful way to train people and train them at the government expense. And uh, one thing about the Navy Jobs Training Program, at the end of the training, there's got to be a job for them. Of course, of course, funded. They got to agree. But once these people are trained, trained, there'll be a job. There. Anytime any of us be interested in a national office business training program, I'll be happy to talk to you about it and with the company or anybody else. I've been up down Mississippi several times and I've talked to several companies, and we have got some national office business training programs in existence. And uh, I don't really push it too much because I've got plenty to do in Pastor Goose. And uh, I've met with Moran Tank over at Natchez, and I've been to Greenville, and uh, talked to them up there. So, uh, any of you might want to know more about it, I'll talk to you later. I'm going to have to check out in a few minutes. I'm going to stop going home. Okay. Do we have any questions now directed at either <coughs> of the groups or any of the individuals? I might ask Brother Dean a question. Uh, do you have any available funding for an apprentice program that would have to comply with the national registration program such like as utility lines? your customer there. Or it's no uh, it's no restrictions in other words they've got one little report to make a month of how many men that's on that, how many men started it, how many men they expect to complete. Once a month. That's all the reports have to make. We got any other questions? I'm passing out right now. Uh, maybe some of you might want to discuss uh, uh, this thing with either Brother Deeves or Brother Turner. There's one thing that I want to mention about the NAPS program that's very important here, and that's the fact that, that where we have a union contract, that uh, any of those programs have to meet the approval of the local union. And uh, Brother Turner has been successful in knocking out the funding of a couple of programs in the state uh, that were designed uh, really to... Uh, undermine the collective bargaining agreement to this effect. Uh, I can remember one situation with Mott Poulter up in Water Valley where they had a group of people on layoff status. Uh, this company had sneaked a proposal through to get a manpower training program funded to train new employees. And uh, he made contact with the local union, found out what the situation was, and found out that they had a bunch of people on layoff status and therefore was able to block funding of that program until those people have been recalled. So you want to keep this in mind that uh, we do have some control of veto power over the particular program he mentioned. Now the program Brother Dees is involved in, we have direct control over the funds there. Uh, he does, uh, and of course I sit on the board of the Appalachian Council. 
And uh, that, that we're not just not going to get out here and fund any program uh, that's not an organized plan and assist and work with the local community. <coughs> Do we have any other questions? Uh, we got just a few minutes here before the coffee break. I think I saw the young man show up out there that's going to take the pictures. Uh, we can spend a couple of minutes and uh, then break, I think, and, uh, and come back and try to finish up in time with some of you get out a little early that wants to leave this afternoon. We can break off this next part of the agenda pretty easy, I think, most anywhere. That deals with the current session of the legislature. Now, I've just passed out, so I hope everybody's got a copy of it, the, the uh, schedule uh, of operation of the current 73 session, which will be limited to 90 days. This was adopted yesterday, and what it amounts to, as you go down and look at it, it gives you the deadlines, number one, for the introduction of bills, uh, deadline for committee reports, and et cetera. This is, uh, this is the Bible for this next session. Uh, if a bill is not prepared and introduced uh, by January the 25th, it's too late. If a committee does not report a bill out and get it on the calendar uh, by the 42nd day on February the 12th, that bill is dead for the session and so on down the line. These deadlines are very important, uh, either in killing a bill or passing a bill. And we have to uh, fight these deadlines on anything that we try to get through the legislature, and quite often uh, we use them sometimes to kill bad legislation. I thought you'd be interested in having a copy of that uh, for your files and consideration when you get back home. I, I don't particularly here about you trying to study it right now, but the fact remains that January the 25th is the deadline for introduction of bills in the current session. Now, under the, under the new procedure adopted by the legislature a few years ago in the annual session, they also adopted a procedure whereby bills could be pre-filed by members of the legislature. In other words, a bill could be drafted, introduced and filed before the legislature convenes in Jackson. Up until this point, there's been something like 500 bills pre-filed. Uh, there's been a number of them filed since the legislature convened last Tuesday. And of course, uh, there's quite a few of these bills of, of very much of uh, interest to us, the members of people that we represent. This afternoon, uh, I want to talk to you a few minutes about some of the items that they'll be considering. I want you to uh, take a position, either for or against some of the, the matters uh, that they'll be considering, or that I'll know what I'm supposed to do as the legislative representative. I've got a list of uh, bills listed on this pad up here, and then I've also got uh, a uh, list of all the bills that have been pre-filed or introduced up until this point. Uh, and if you've got anything on your mind, any particular piece of legislation that you want to know whether it's been introduced or not, I can probably look it up for you uh, in a minimum length of time. Uh, <clears throat> I want to uh, run over with you a number of items that I've got listed down here that, uh, that I think worth consideration here this afternoon. Some of them uh, needs the attention or action on the part of the board, and some of them won't because uh, we've already took a position. Uh, I'll briefly run through the list with you. Number one is, the, is House Bill 115 that was pre-filed which is known as the State Occupational and Safe, uh, uh, Safety Health Act. Uh, I'm going to hold that discussion on that one in advance until later on in the meeting because, uh, in my opinion, it's one of the most important bills that will be considered by this session, and it will take quite a bit of discussion in order for you to fully understand what all the ramifications are. The other item that I consider of great importance at this session that needs the attention and action on the part of this uh, board 
There's no fall insurance. There's been a number of bills introduced on this side. Another one is uh, workman's compensation, the need to further improve our state's workman's compensation act, especially in this area of the injured worker having the right to choose his doctor. There's been a bill pre-filed on that particular issue. That's House Bill 159. You might make a note of this, Bob. Uh, I've had some inquiries from the Natchez area about this. You can tell Slim Hedge when you get back that that bill has been pre-filed. Another one is on unemployment insurance. No action necessary there, but I think well, I ought to bring you up to date on what the next move is going to be made in this area. Uh, the tax situation, revenue situation, uh, is one that uh, is of great importance right now. I don't think it's necessary to take any action, but I think you need to be made aware of where we are. You should have received a copy of a letter that I wrote each member of the legislature recently on that subject. And if you read that, you'll be fairly well informed about the present situation on money. Another one is uh, uh, there will be an attempt made in this session uh, to, uh, to create a new state labor board of education. And a decision will have to be made on this body as to what you want to do in this area and whether or not you want to, <coughs> uh, you'd have to support a constitutional amendment on this one as to eliminate the uh, state superintendent of education as elective office or make an appointed, uh, appointed position by the new state board of education. That's the one that needs action today. Another one that uh, we think we, we ought to take a position on is a bill to license car practice in the state. At the present time we have car practice practicing, but they're not licensed by the state and we have a bunch of quacks and what have you in the profession. The good people in the profession would like to see it licensed in some regulation. Uh, in view of the fact that uh, we have people that patronize these people, we think that, uh, that we ought to uh, support a, li a bill to license car practice. Another one is on the county unit system. This has received a lot of publicity around the state, whereby uh, we have a situation where uh, in most of the counties, each uh, member of the supervisor, board of supervisors, has his own little uh, road building uh, uh, machine and equipment. He got five different systems. And uh, at least one county, that's Oklahoma, I believe, they have one county unit system, and uh, they have established the fact that the counties can save a lot of money and be much more efficient by one county unit system. I want you to take a position on that one. Another one that Tom will take up a little time with you on is, uh, is a program he's been working on on, uh, on the hospital facilities and so forth here in the state. He's, uh, he's accepted a position on a on a commission that's been studying this one. There'll be a bill introduced on that one. I'll leave that one for him to expand on. Uh, another bill that, uh, that's been up over there several times, and I was accused the last time of killing it, which I wasn't, and that's uh, a bill to uh, bring about the inspection of boilers throughout the state. Uh, I think it's something that's badly needed, but at last in the last session, I was of the opinion, was misled into believing that the state OSHA Act would cover things of this kind, but it doesn't. There's no question of what we ought to have, a systematic inspection of boilers whereby they have to be safe and don't blow up and things of this kind. Uh, another matter we <coughs> never took a position on, which I think we have to give con serious consideration to, and that's uh, legislation to preserve our natural resources, such as the wetlands and and what have you. Another item that they'll be considering, which I believe we took a position on some time back, was the creation of a kindergarten in the public school system. <coughs> that one I think will be passed with a little help this time because the money's there. There is a bill uh, been pre-filed that will give firefighters the right of collective bargaining, which I think we automatically support under our setup anyhow. Another bill that directly affects another one of our unions is a bill that was pre-filed to give uh, bus drivers the right to collective bargaining when and if the city 
purchase the bus line, and that uh, right now would affect the bus, the, bu the uh, Jackson bus drivers, which it looks like the city's going to take over the bus system. That bill is designed primarily for their benefit. It also happened in Hattiesburg. They got a right. study going on where to discontinue the service of the city. Right. Over well, over. this this bill would cover any of those situations where we have a union, you see, and they, they have they've been bargaining with the with the uh, system, whoever might own it. If the city takes them over, anybody takes them over, then they would then have the legal right to bargain and continue bargaining with whoever took them over. Uh, that's just a few of the of the bills and items that's uh, on the agenda over there. There will be some more, but that's just an idea about the, the, the kind of things that uh, that we're going to have to be dealing with in this session. I see the coffee's uh, arrived. We'll take the coffee break and uh, take about 15 minutes come back and we'll, I'll get the photographer and we'll get set up and get the pictures and then continue. Before we start the uh, meeting and everybody gets uh, their horse cranked up ready to get out of here, uh, let me, let me advise you of this, that under the Constitution, we are required to hold at least two board meetings a year. And uh, uh, unless something uh, develops that requires another meeting this year, I, I'm thinking about the possibility of having a meeting probably the latter part of the year. Uh, by so doing, uh, will not only fulfill the obligations of the Constitution, but by that time we ought to have something to report to you on in connection with some of the things that you've considered here this afternoon. Now, the TIE program, if we're successful in getting anything worked out that <coughs> meet the approval of the executive committee, then I assume that motion you adopted this afternoon indicates you want us to go ahead with it, right? So we'll proceed in that direction. And, but we will keep you informed uh, uh, to go along. And then, of course, the other, there's another thing that uh, that I've got to do as a result of the convention action and that snafu we had, if you remember, on the election of officers. I'm, I've got to set up a committee to uh, uh, look at the Constitution and make any recommendations they deem fit. Uh, prior to the next convention, and my understanding on that was that that committee should be set up, make its report back to this executive board, and the board then would itself uh, uh, submit any proposed constitutional changes at the 1974 convention. And if that's the, if that meets the approval of the board, that's the direction we'll follow. I'll try to get that committee set up sometime. Uh, in the early part of this year, where well, they'll have an opportunity to, uh, you know, get into the Constitution and then get ready for the recommendations and have those ready for the next board meeting sometime in the latter part of this year. Then we can get that out of the way in plenty of time for the for the convention, uh, which I believe, what month we set it for? July, I October. 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 Is it October? October 74. Uh, but anyhow, if it's Start with you. I'll go ahead and try to get that committee working and be prepared to report to the next meeting this year and get that out of the way. Okay. All right. The other thing that. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes. What day is October? Fourteen through seventeen. IBW convention is in October. It's uh, supposed to be before then. We uh, checked all that out. We uh, thought when we, we set that, Joe. <laughs> I think. Uh, I've gone. I've got it somewhere, but well, you don't you find out anything definite on that level. Let us right. know. Yeah. That's not hard and fast now. We've got right. this thing right. reservation set at this hotel they're building. Uh, See, they ain't got the hotel completed yet. <laughs> <laughs> we, we might have to meet somewhere else. Uh, I might call it to your attention that that's one of the hotel national teams that's been bought by the city. <gasps> What's that, Mr. When? Chairman? When? Huh? When? When? By who? By Pennsylvania Building and Trade. Over a shopping center. 
Well, they're not boycotted. I mean, are they using union labor though here? Huh? Are they using union labor here? I don't know. Yeah, I know they are. Yeah, they're, they're it's a union job here. Has this action been taken by the FLCIO building and trade? We receive all kind of correspondence from the uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania building and trade. We never have got anything on Pennsylvania. Well, we haven't received anything from the national office and uh, before a boycott's official. We're expected to honor the thing. It's supposed to be an, uh, ratified and initiated by the Executive Council of the AFL-CIO. We've had a lot of static on these things in the right. past, you know. And uh, I don't recall anything coming into the office on this, Jack. It might well be, you know, they've had a problem there and they're asking everybody else to uh, uh, cooperate with them. I don't know about what authority is done. Uh, we've got well, we need to know about this before we get too far. I know. Well, we haven't exactly. even received a union call. That's luck. Yeah. That's what we say. HRDL has all their staff conference in Sheraton. Yeah. I mean, and we were there at the LCO. And building trades in uh, Pittsburgh. Go there. Well, asking everybody to boycott the church over there because they're using non union labor and uh, don't even want to recognize it. Don't even want to meet with them. So this just out from that uh, building trade council. Up there, well, they 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 they're using uh, the local building tradesmen on this one, I understand. Well, we'll uh, we'll uh, take a look at this situation. We don't want to get ourselves in a, in a in a bad situation, and if it warrants it, we can move it. I'm glad you brought this to our attention. We'll check it out. Let's see if we can get this thing over. Some of them want to get on the road. Uh, <coughs> view of the time, i tell you what we're going to do. I'm going to ask Brother Knight uh, to start with uh, to give you a rundown on this uh, group that he's working with now on uh, on uh, health facilities, hospitals, and so forth. A bill that's been drawn, but I don't think it's been introduced yet, Tom. It's, uh, I've got a rough draft of it. I haven't seen any sign of it yet on the like the report. It hasn't been filed yet, or officially introduced. Uh, but in view of uh, that thing, I'm going to ask you to explain to them what's going on there, and then they can either adopt a motion to uh, support the legislation or not to, and then I'll be going through this list and checking out the ones I think we need to act on and cut them down as much as I can before we can get through here as quick as we can, okay? Uh, as briefly as I can, to give you a little idea of what we're talking about, the government early last year set up the State Comprehensive Health Planning Council. This is an, uh, an organization came about as a result of the, uh, um, the national organization of the same name. It is a, a federal a, a federal state outfit. It's funded by federal money, mostly. And uh, <coughs> then uh, in each area, or in most of the heavier populated areas of the state, there is an area comprehensive health planning council, which works. In other words, the two is kind of like the state AFL, CIO, and the local central body. And... Uh, Oh, early last year, I received a telephone call which asked me to submit a list of names of the members or leadership of organized labor throughout the state to be submitted to the government uh, for positions on these various councils and committees uh, with regard to this health planning program. I wound up on the task force of the state organizations who... Uh, Primarily, the task force's job was primarily to come up with uh, legislation uh, to provide for what is known as a certificate of need. Now, I've uh, got a, quite an education the short time I've been on this thing regarding uh, health uh, care facilities in this state and a number of things, uh, facts and figures having to do with it. Now. I don't know. I noticed Brother Sly showed me a letter today. He's been invited to join the uh, State <coughs> Comprehensive Health Planning Council. We've got a few people throughout the state. I submitted a list of about 35 people. Now, if we could get all of these on some of these committees, 
we would at least have a voice in uh, what uh, goes on in these programs. I haven't had complete reports. I don't know who we got. But <coughs> be that as it may, I found that at the very outset that the state of Mississippi has only a 78.5% occupancy of all available hospital beds in this state. Now, this was a shock to me. Because you walk in certain hospitals, certainly it's particularly your larger cities like Jackson, every room is full and they got two or three patients out in the hall with sheets strung around. Well, you think, you know, there's a shortage everywhere. Well, this don't seem to be the case based on the uh, figures that the so-called authorities uh, have compiled. And uh, <coughs> this, of course, uh, tends to bring uh, to run the prices of, of uh, hospital rooms and the medical services up because they, they're charging enough for the rooms that are filled to pay for them that are not filled. Simply means this, that in certain areas of the state there are more beds and more hospital <coughs> and medical facilities available than there's a need for in others. There's quite a shortage of this. Now this certificate of need simply does this. It provides <coughs> that any private or public facility which is classified as a hospital. If they want to build a structure, add to a structure, or remodel the present structure, including a hundred thousand dollars or more, under this law would have to file an application with the authority, in this case which would be your state a commission for hospital care. I'm going to stop right there. This worries me because we know how some of these commissions and boards are stacked and uh, yeah, most of the times they're, they're people that don't see like we do. And uh, I stopped and uh, stopped them and got some information on this. This commission, hospital commission, is made up of uh, six people including the state health officer who is an ex-official member at the present time, it's made up of uh, three doctors, a member of the State Board of Pharmacy, they are a pharmacist. I'm not sure if he's a member of the uh, pharmacy. The health officer and, uh, well, the other party's uh, profession escapes me right now. But this is something else I ask. If the state law requires that the members of this commission has to be from the medical profession and it does not. You see, I want to know first of all who composed this commission and what qualifications you got to have and the rules and regulations that have to be adhered to in filling these vacancies before we go into some support legislation giving this commission all of this authority which this piece of legislation would give. So that helped my feelings. And these are on staggered terms, I believe. I'm not sure if it's four or six years. So we've got the information to all. I haven't had a chance to check it thoroughly. All right. Before <coughs> this, uh, this uh, uh, hospital, whether it be private or public, would uh, get permission to renovate or expand or build this facility, they would have to appear before the area, in this case it's the Central Mississippi Health Planning Council, of which I'm a member of the Board of Directors of that cover seven counties in Central Mississippi. Most other areas of the state does have one. If there are areas where an application is made for a permit to do this expansion or this uh, uh, construction of a health facility, then the application would be submitted to the <coughs> State Comprehensive Health Planning Council. They then have the authority to investigate the area, to look at the number of <coughs> beds they want to expand to or to build to, and then examine the population in the area to determine whether or not, in fact, this is needed to meet the health needs of the area. In other words, to put it another way, this certificate of need is designed to balance out the hospital facilities, medical facilities available to where 
the facilities are more nearly equally available to every section of the state. There's a number of counties in this state, of course, the smaller counties with the real small county seats where there's absolutely no, uh, nothing which could be classified as hospital facilities. They got to drive to the next county <coughs> over several counties to get to hospital facilities. After the, uh, this law provides that after the health planning council, whether it be the area or the state, the king, in the absence of the area council, uh, gathers all of the information that deems necessary, then they can hold a hearing. And of course, the proponents, the, the applicant for the, the permit naturally is, is allowed uh, uh, ample time to present its case. If there's any opponents of the thing, they have ample time to present their case before the, the council, which the appropriate council at that time. Then, if uh, there is still disagreement, it provides that you can go to Chancery Court and be heard in the Chancery Court. Um, now, briefly, that's what the thing is all about, is to try to distribute the health facilities available as nearly as possible to the whole citizenry of the state is really what it does. In other words, uh, it prevents a uh, group of people from getting out here and decide, well, we want to put up a, a, a modern hospital where maybe there's already a fairly adequate services available. And uh, the intent of this thing is to provide the services more nearly equal to all, everybody in the state and also the long, uh, the long run uh, effects of it is supposed to hold down the cost <coughs> of hospital and medical services. Now, that's about what it's about. Of course, the task force, uh, we've had uh, a couple of members of the legislature who are, <coughs> are on uh, public health committees appear before the task force, and uh, they have uh, uh, committed themselves to uh, support it in the legislature. And I told Claude before we go any further that I would like, of course, he's the legislative rep, since I'm on this thing, I'd like some action to come out of this board on it. Because we, you know, we're going to be put on the spot here. Uh, frankly, I can't see any real bugs in it. Now, it's not going to correct all the problems. It's not going to just change everything overnight. But uh, I'm unable to really see any, anything wrong with it. The thing I was interested in was this hospital commission. And I'm still interested in trying to get some people on that other than doctors and drugs, you know? I think we ought to have somebody from the public, somebody from labor, if you please, I'm on, on that, that hospital committee. commission. Because it's going to be all powerful, really, in the end. It's the one that will actually issue this permit or deny it after hearings, uh, a series of hearings are held for all sides to present their case and be heard. If I understand you correctly, legislation uh, in effect would do this regardless of funding private or public the person would have to be <coughs> the group or what have you would have to be given a permit before they build a hospital right. know, that's licensed by right. this commission there'd right. be no right. jumping out building right. hospitals right. by anybody unless they first went before and justified the hospital in a particular area before this commission right. Or expand those or already expand. existing facilities. That, I think, is probably one of the things that might be in foremost of some people's minds. Uh, is actually regulate the building of hospitals and make sure the needs there before somebody jumps out to build a hospital. This is it. Right? This is it. All right. So, has anybody got any questions now uh, on this particular thing? I've got one. All right. What advantage would it be to us to keep these people from building? Well, <coughs> the reason I said that, we got a, a pupil, we got a North Mississippi Medical Hospital up there for several counties around there. They were groups that came in there some few months ago and wanted to build another hospital. Well, the city officials and so forth, they beat that thing. They can't build it. We really need one. I couldn't see any advantage if they have to go to this commission. If it's stacked against us, they're not going to be 
it will turn that to sell one. Well, so I'm really needed in our location. Well, Joe, I don't know that, that the commission is such stacked against it. Uh, but what I meant by my <coughs> remarks was that I, I was interested in finding out how it is. Uh, this commission is, uh, you know, how they get appointed, and if there's regulations that have to be met that they come from a, from the medical profession. That's why I think that we ought to work the next vacancy to get this clown we got as a clown that will follow him to uh, put somebody, we need somebody in the labor movement, somebody in the public on this thing. Now, there will be, as I say, there is um, uh, procedures in this legislation, if, a, if it's enacted, which will allow a thorough airing of the need of a facility in the area. And uh, as I say, I think, uh, and I, I'm bound to, uh, prone to agree with the, the thought that this would help hold down the cost of hospital services because there is, as I say, only 78.5% occupancy of all available <laughs> hospital rooms. Well, they're simply the, the rooms that are being used are paying for them that's not being utilized. And the, the, the intent behind this, of course, is to try to have all of the, the services and facilities available that are really needed in any area that needs one based on the amount of population uh, compared to the number of available rooms in the area that needs one, and I don't <coughs> think would have any problem obtaining a permit. Well, Tom? Yeah? Do you reckon they're going to try to use this to keep out private hospitals? Well, uh, uh, you know, they got a group coming in to pass the bill on Well, they, they, they hadn't been uh, in, in the, the discussions I've been in on uh, uh, Russell, any, any uh, uh, impression. I haven't got that impression. I can understand uh, how I the Board of Supervisors in Jackson County is trying to find a hospital because when the Board of Supervisors need yeah. two or three hundred thousand dollars, they, they up the room rate and apart from the hospital. And uh, I think they borrowed three hundred thousand from the hospital last year. Well, let me ask a question, Tom, is it possible that this statewide commission might even be some advantage in offsetting the battle that the local community put up for hospitals actually needed? Well, that's, that's no, no. Would it or not? Not necessarily. You see, Jim, uh, mean, in I'm most right. areas now, and I can't name, I can't give you the down to the dot answer, but in most areas of the state, in most counties, there is already an area council. Yeah. But where there is an area council, they have the sole discretion to conduct this hearing and, and provide all of the facts and testimony <laughs> per, per, pertaining to the applicant and the need for that only facility in the, the council. The only time a state council would have any right. say so would be in an area where there's no area council. An area council about designate any number of counties. It can yeah, be it any is certain, certain counties. This one here, the central Mississippi, has seven counties. In mm -hmm. each. And there are other area councils, and they have a certain number of counties. Now, getting back state. to my question, take yeah. this one that you know has got seven counties. Yeah. Say some group wanted to come to Hines County, which is one of the seven yeah, counties, and build right. a hospital. Right. You were to and say the local board of supervisors in Hines County was fighting that group. Then is it possible to get this area planning commission to uh, award them a certificate saying the need exists, and would that all set one group in one little <coughs> county trying to keep one out if it was needed? And that was my question. Yeah. Well, that's I think we're applying Joe's situation. Right. And we're trying to get an answer for his problem. Right. Uh, if it do that, I'd be far. If it don't, well, <laughs> well, <laughs> well that'd be you call it. what significance does the issuing of the certificate have? Does it mean it will be built or it will not be built? If they issue the certificate, it will be built. If it's denied, there'll be no certificate issued. Even if it's on a private basis and individuals want to invest their money? Right, private or public. No, no, well, they're all lumped in there. 
Well, if 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 they uh, if they uh, if they should, uh, as a matter of fact, I think there's uh, there's procedure there to take them to court. But if they are if they insist and if they go ahead, then they will not be allowed to collect on Medicare or Medicaid. Or receive bill burden. That's right. So if a private wants to take it on, and I doubt seriously that the participant would he would deny the construction of the facility. That was the question I was trying to get answered. Would it or would it? Have you gone well, this far it's into it? It's a rather complicated situation. I can see that. Uh, I hurriedly glanced through the proposed bill. Basically, I think this is what they're attempting to do. He's already outlined to you about the disparity on hospital facilities, where you've got insufficient rooms in one area and too many rooms someplace else. But as I view the thing, what this will ultimately do would be something similar to a uh, uh, city uh, commission, what do you call it, for building permits, what have you, of licensing the erection of a hospital. This would be a state statute would actually have the final authority on whether or not the permit was granted to build that hospital. In the absence <coughs> of that permit, a permit, I think they'd have a little trouble uh, getting the hospital built. Now, how, how this would tie in with private enterprise and what have you, I don't fully understand. Uh, you know, I think this is the part, some answers here that we have to find, I think. Well, this, this is uh, getting to be pretty prevalent, and I don't know whether it's a really pertinent to the question or not. You know, doctors out there. Yeah. So, yeah, there were five doctors that invested their money in this facility and operated it for, what, three years? Yeah. Now, another private outfit out of uh, Kentucky came down and purchased the thing, and they netted $18 for every dollar invested on the sale. Part of this group is the one that went out and bought uh, the Riverside uh, Psychiatric Hospital. And the group now is contemplating uh, the conversion of the old hotel down on the campus of the Riverside, or not the Riverside, but the railroad, okay, yeah. into uh, the competing clinic for arsenic in New Orleans. I heard they give that up, Jack. They give well, up on the King uh, Edward Theater. Yeah. I don't know what they're doing. They're sleeping on it for the time being because of the particular structure down there. So will this commission go into the charges that the hospital officially charges is what I would No, uh, no they don't. Uh, no. No, oh, it would be a license uh, thing or anything else. It's it's a a license. Uh, let, let, let me ask another question. Maybe we get on the table what we're really trying to dig at. Who's pushing the passage of the legislation? Is it the governor? Is it the legislature? The doctors? No, it's the it's it's this uh this this committee, Jim, this council that's that's uh, been appointed. Uh, the state but appointed by who? Appointed by the governor. Right. So it's the governor's idea. And it's a fairly it's a fairly representative group, and I find that uh, that uh, matter of fact, I was surprised. I was surprised at the makeup of the group and their attitude. Uh, really. Now, I'm not, I'm not uh, whitewashing any of them or anything like that, but... Uh, Tom, let me ask you a question. You said that this, uh, this committee uh, would just rule whether you didn't have a, a central committee? Is that right? Yeah, the state, well, the state organization the state would organization. act on an application where there's no area health plan. All right, wait, wait. What if all the areas in the state went ahead and made them one? Wouldn't that do away with the no, they wouldn't do away with the state health planning council. They they would simply uh, to do that, that area. <laughs> <laughs> you see, you, you see, the, the reason for this is that the people in the local area are more familiar to start with with the needs in the present facility than an area. See, so well, what I what I was thinking about is we might get some people on this uh, state, but then they turn around and. 
group would go ahead and, and start their council, and then, then we wouldn't have nobody on that side. Well, of course, there again, it's important that we try to get somebody in on all these things. I mean, whether we've got a certificate of need or not, as long as you've got these kind of groups <coughs> and uh, that, that doing all this stuff, we need to try to have somebody on there. One of them will probably can try to be in on what they're trying to do. Let, let, let me ask you another question. Who selected their council? Uh, they're <coughs> they're designated uh, on the recommendations of the state organization. So based on the nominations they get, yeah. each organization, as I understand it, was asked just like we were yeah. to submit names. So, so people actually, they'd like to have actually, actually then building. using the Hines County thing again, say five doctors did own a hospital. Then three of them could wind up on this council if it worked out that way, and then they could sit on everybody's well, building they could, they could, yeah. for their own yeah. selfish interests. I'm yeah. opposed to it. Well, one man the Jackson on the council. Yeah. Before, before they have a, a meeting or a business, I don't want to do it in place now, but it has to go before some. I mean, it's an actual. I don't know what the deal is on that. I know it's a Well, the commission, you've got the commission on hospital care, but really they don't. They don't really have a lot of say so if they want to build a hospital for the public or a, a group or individual of any kind. I mean, they don't really have no say so. And that's for Charlie. Mr. Chairman, I don't know what the discussion really has transpired here in full. I'd leave for home and all. Yeah. I would be for supporting the legislation. Supporting legislation to support the council in <coughs> determining matters so long as federal funding is involved. And I'm talking about Medicare, Medicaid, still Burton. Uh, I would hate to interfere with private investments in the medical facility that might be available just because you couldn't issue a certificate of need. I think competition. Bear in mind, now this is a hundred thousand dollars above. Now I realize it don't take much of an expansion to go above a hundred thousand dollars. The place that the size is really set. But uh, <laughs> if you got an X-ray machine in it without anything, that's the room for the ten thousand. Well, let, let me let me say something. Now I've been uh, asked to invest in private hospitals, and I've been investigated to, to in the Hilliburton thing and everything else. Some of the people are building on hospitals to exploit the people with, to be segregation, integration, and everything else. I mean, they're doing it. I mean, I was invited to, uh, to do these things, which this commission, I guess, is doing an investigation on the Hill Burke. We in Adams County are uh, one mill to support the hospital. Well, that's it was built with federal, and we still pay him one mill. As he's talking about that supervisor, I don't know what they're doing. And we set up facilities down there, and we got a the pathologist down there, two of them, is making $250,000 a year because they get all of the surrounding yeah. areas. That's the reason I was asking about the cost. They come in from 50 miles out. Under the, under the act we got there, and we're paying 1% plus these uh, pathologists are exploiting the man. There ain't no telling what their income is. And these There's areas no could well become to the supervisor or anybody else who owns the hospital to regulate and never let private enterprise nobody else in. Well, private enterprise one is going to exploit it. I mean, if, if you've looked into some of these homes that's being built for the elderly people and the old and aged and everything else, uh, if you're really looking to uh, the cost of hospitals, because it hadn't gone up that much, because the nurses hadn't gone up, because we tried to organize the hospital at home and make a union, and those people are still making minimal wage. And what is the cost of power and light and everything else? Huh? I mean, what, where, is, where is the money going? Uh, I mean, this is what I'm talking about. This letter here, I don't know what it's all about. I just got yeah. this one day before I come from home. I don't know either. The chairman of this is, uh, maybe somebody knows him. His name is uh, John M. Berger, Jr., DDS, Dental <laughs> Doctor Surgery, and Kosciuszko, the chairman of the committee out there, wanted me to serve on. I wasn't going to get involved in it either. So you can. I way down in southwest Mississippi, and Kosciuszko was up here where the chairman from. I don't know what kind of they said the committee's up. I think we got we got us a tough one to deal with right now. 
But I don't think we ought to shut the door on it. I'd like to make uh, a motion that it stay open for, for Brother Knight to well, make a what, what, uh, what I was going to recommend, uh, obviously, we need more information, uh, Tom. Uh, we need some things, a few, uh, few points clarified uh, and so forth. And uh, the bill hasn't been filed yet. As soon as the bill is filed, we'll take a close look at it and then dig up this information and find out just what, uh, what authority all this originates to begin with, whether it's a result of federal legislation, whether or not there's federal monies involved, which I think there is in the planning stages anyhow. Uh, and then maybe just refer this matter to the executive committee uh, for consideration instead of trying to make a decision today.
Uh, there's a couple of real pertinent things that I feel that uh, that needs uh, some discussion, needs uh, you need to take a position on, that directly re relates to your membership. We haven't yet took a position on. One of them is no fault insurance. Uh, the National AFL-CIO course is already on record in support of the no-fault concept. But, you know, when you start talking about no-fault insurance, you're talking about a great big ball of wax. And uh, I hope everybody understands that we're not talking about just no fall period. The legislation that I think that we ought to think about supporting would be a partial no fall bill, something along these lines, uh, whereby uh, your carrier that you have your insurance with, automobile insurance with, if you had an accident, <coughs> regardless of whose fault it was, would be responsible for paying your the damages up to something like five thousand uh, dollars, you know, uh, and lost wages and what have you, hospital care, and if you had a serious case beyond that point, you then would still have the right to sue in court for punitive damages or what have you. Now, I'm advised that. Uh, that a, well, I think something like 80%, maybe a higher percent than that, uh, of automobile accidents will fall in this category, whereby your carrier uh, would pick up the cost, and that only a small percent would fall in the in the damage suit category if, if partial no fault is adopted. We have several bills over there in this uh, in the hopper now. This. The idea behind the whole thing, I don't think I, I, I need to uh, berate this thing with you. I think all of you are aware of the fact that you're paying through the nose for automobile insurance. It's about twice as expensive as it ought to be. When you have an accident, you have all kinds of trouble of collecting because it's a question of who's supposed to pay. Now, under no fault, there's no question about who pays up to a given point. It's automatic. The thing that you save on is, is lawyer fees. Now, the studies that I've read indicate that uh, something almost 50% of the premium dollar paid out for automobile insurance in this country goes for lawyer's fees, both damage suit lawyers, lawyers representing the insurance companies, and a small percent for overhead, you see. And the rest goes to claim. Now, you're going to find when this thing gets up over here again, as it did last year, that the people that's really fighting the no-fault uh, no concept will be the damage suit lawyers, such as Ross Barnett, who's made a filthy fortune on damage suits. Well, now, that's to be expected because that's where they've made their money. But the thing that I'm concerned about, and I think everybody at this table is concerned about, is doing something about the high cost of automobile insurance and whereby you'll get uh, your settlement adjusted uh, in, a, in a reasonable length of time. Is this not correct? Now, we got a, we got a situation over here where the governor has stuck his foot in his mouth in opposition to no-fault insurance. And I, I don't know what this means, but also at the same time, Evelyn Gandy, <coughs> the commissioner of insurance, has come out strongly in favor of the no-fault concept. She's pretty powerful. Right. I don't think it's anything but right, uh, you know, that uh, just think about what a savings it'll be to the membership out there in this day and time. Now, what, what I think we ought to do is to take a position in favor of a partial no-fault insurance bill, a reasonable no-fault insurance bill, and then we'll see what we can do as far as the amount leave it kind of hanging where we're not nailing ourselves <laughs> on any particular thing. Let me let me ask one question before you get a motion on it, Mr. Chairman. Does that thing have something like workman's comp to determine the amount of permanent partial disability to hold when they make claim claims settlement? Well, it would be it would be something like this, Bob. Uh, like under workman's comp, you know, you got a disability to the bar, partial disability to the bar. Well, that, that again, you see, was, was where this amount would get into the picture that if the lost wages and what have you 
went above this particular amount, then you would be able to go into court, go into court and get a settlement. That's, That's the reason I'm against just no fault period across the board. I think the person ought to still have the right to sue in the court. Well, that's case. what I'm. I'm Lost what for I'm life, yeah. or you know, uh, crippled for life. You ought to have the right to go in and collect a couple of hundred thousand dollars, and where if you're disabled, where you couldn't uh, work the rest of your life. You know. So we're talking about partial no fault on simple accidents, not real serious cases. You know. Well, I'm in favor of that. I mean, one right. time just. No fall across the table. Right, I'm right. I'm not. In, not I wasn't in favor of that, but right. I mean, where you still no already claim the right to go into court, uh, and where you take yourself a couple hundred dollars a month. If you got two automobiles, that's about what you. That's where I think in the way to hear comp, you got a certain amount for life that you can't. No matter how much you sue for, that's it. I'm well, you're, pr you're prohibited from suing. That's right. right. The law. Well, I'm in this partial. We don't want to get into that thing, right? Well, that's my thinking. Can we? Can we take action on that? I make a motion that we take a look at this partial uh, no fault. All right, a reasonable no fault is no reasonable right. no fault. That's right. Uh, that gives us a little leeway. Leeway. That's right. right. I'll second the motion. All right. Any any discussion on that one? Not all in favor of the motion signify it to say an aye. Aye. I'm going to save this naughty one for last. I'm going to try to get the ones that I think we need to act on here this afternoon. I <coughs> Workman's Comp and Unemployment <coughs> Insurance. Uh, we already on record on that. I got no problems with that. Uh, uh, let me let me see why you looking yeah. at your list there on this. Uh, th this thing come out of our, our local union and it's been introduced by senators down in our area about this Workman's Comp thing of uh, choosing your own lawyer because we've had some permanent right. partial disability. We've had these company doctors, which they right. on the payroll of the company, say five, six, seven, eight, maybe ten yeah. thousand dollars a month, and they evaluate your disability, the partial right. disability, and you have no way you're not going to get another doctor to, to disagree with your own personal physician. You won't do that. I mean, that's reason yeah. you're interested in. Well, we got two areas on workman's compensation uh, that I think that we already are on record on, <coughs> and that one is the choice of physician, and the other one is this attorney uh, uh, fee bet, whereby if a person is forced to litigate his case, uh, you know, then then the person or the carrier or what have you that forced that injured individual into going into court should pay that be responsible for paying the attorney fee. That's the two areas that we need some real improvement made in the law. And I assume that that's our position, you see. Well, we've already taken action to board. Right, that, but I right, and that's remind. what I hope we can work on this time. We made not the kind of improvements I'd like to see. There's still room for improvement on the weekly benefits, uh, total disability, and what have you. You know, in the last session, you did a real good job. And it's a little early to come back on that one yet, but there's still a lot of room to go. But this session, I think we ought to concentrate on the, the choice of doctor and the attorney situation. And bills have been introduced to, to do those. There's another area that you had need of improvement too. Which one is that, Jack? This is discount price for a lump sum settlement. Oh, yeah. See, when a decision is made for total disability yeah. or a lump sum settlement, it's based on 450 weeks. Yeah. 4%. And a winner is, <coughs> a winner is either too young or too old. Yeah. You never receive the value of the comp. Yeah. No question, of, no question of that. Of course, the the whole thing centers around the fact that the that the maximum amount is way too low. The maximum yeah. amount ought to be one hundred fifty to two hundred thousand dollars, instead of twenty five thousand. If you well, had the maximum up high enough, that's twenty one thousand. Huh? Twenty one. Yeah, right. It's worth twenty three five. Twenty three five. I was thinking about the original bill. Right. What'd you say? Uh, it's worth to get killed much of Mississippi than any the other state in the union, you know. I mean, it's, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, can we? We got we got the motion in on no fault. Let's see, we got several other other matters. Uh, well, I don't know which one to pick here first. Uh, I won't bear 
much to have some discussion on the state archer act and the time is running late maybe these other matters can be handled like kelly referred maybe we ought to take up the state archer thing and see how we'll come out on that before we take any of these other matters up is that okay that's going to be i think one of the most important bills we're faced with uh, along with some of these other things now all of you are aware of the fact that the federal government or the Congress of the United States in 1970 enacted a rather comprehensive piece of legislation known as the National Health and Safety Act, were you not? Uh, we did some uh, correspondence and our communications to all of the affiliates, uh, <coughs> how to locate the people that was responsible for these in the act. And we thought, you know, as a result of that act, that we were on our way, that we'd have uh, factory inspectors all over the place, we'd have safe working conditions in the workplace and what have you. And all of a sudden, we woke up one morning and found out that in this dang statute, they included a section, I believe it's section C, with a provision in it that states could pass legislation and take over the duties of the federal act, provided it uh, met the same requirements and so forth the federal statute. Frankly, I didn't even know that section was in the law until after the act had been uh, passed for some time. Uh, and uh, we've had, a, I've attended a couple of conferences where this subject was discussed and uh, all of a sudden I realized that we had a real problem to deal with here in the state of Mississippi and all of the other uh, 49 states. Now, it's a rather complicated situation and it would take too long to go into it in all detail with you. But under the federal statute, the states can, as I've told you, enact legislation and take over factory inspection. And the Nixon administration is hell-bent on seeing that all of the states move in and take over factory inspection. This was established at a conference in Atlanta, Georgia that I attended uh, prior to Christmas when the chief honcho of the administration was there who is responsible for administering the law his name was tom brown and he in effect said that this was the direction the administration was moving in that they were going to do their best to see that the states enacted legislation and take over uh factory inspection now under this statute States uh, were allowed to make applications for grants, uh, federal money, for the purpose of, of doing a study and planning and so forth uh, for a state act. John Bell Williams uh, appointed Mr. Dick Whitehead, who we had at our convention last, to address the convention as a state OSHA director, and at the same time, and I must say he kept this rather quiet, uh, this uh, happened in March, March the 16th, 1971, put the, the responsibility of policing OSHA, the state OSHA Act, into the hands of the state health department. And in his executive order, he uh, made application for the grant, they got the money, they made the study, and during the last year, they have been very quietly putting this legislation together. They've got a comprehensive plan about this thing on implementation of the act. And I haven't been able to get a copy of it yet. I've wrote Mr. Whitehead a couple of letters uh, requesting a copy of the statute and on his face I told him that it appeared that the statute 
did meet the, 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 the state statute did meet the, the requirements of the Federal Act, but the guts of the proposition would not be in the statute, but instead would be in the plan of implementation. I wrote him that letter on November the 22nd. I uh, don't think it ought to read the whole letter to you, but this is what I said to the gentleman in the last, par last paragraph. In view of the importance of this proposed piece of legislation and its importance bearing on the welfare of the working people of this state, it is imperative that I review the plan in detail. The state FLCO executive board will be meeting shortly before the legislature convenes next year, and we will decide whether or not to support this legislation. I would therefore appreciate a copy of the plan at an early date. <coughs> I didn't get a answer that letter, but I did receive a notice from Mr. Whitehead when the bill was pre-filed. I went over and picked up a copy of the bill and studied it. Then I got another notice along with some other people that copies of the Mississippi Occupational Safety Health Plan manual would be available for review at our office, and he lists the address and so forth, and the hours it could be reviewed. He said this plan in the compliance manual was submitted to the U.S. Department of Labor for review and approval of suggested corrections on November the 17th, 1972. And he goes on to say that he earnestly solicits our support, et cetera. Well, I couldn't get a copy of the plan, so I finally went out to Mr. Whitehead's office and took a look at the plan. And all I could do was to glance through it and see what I could find in terms of money, how many people was going to be employed, you know, uh, and so forth. And uh, this is what it did. And uh, I've got a few notes that I made on this thing, and I'm still not too sure where we are and whether or not uh, we need to try to support the bill. I do know this, that very quietly, Bill Waller, the governor, <coughs> Some other people around him are laying the groundwork for passage of this particular piece of legislation. I read a couple of letters by him in the plan where he supported it, you see. And the, the reason on that, I think, is very simple. And that's the fact that there's going to be something like 25 or 30 jobs involved, you know, and it'll mean some appointments to these positions. Now, the thing that I'm concerned about, and our people in Washington are likewise concerned, and they admitted to me, by the way, in the, in the Atlanta conference, that they will allow this section to get sneaked into the bill, the state's rights section, giving the state the right to set up these state uh, agencies in the first place. See, I think we'd be better off with a uniform federal system to start with. We can just look at our workers' comp system and see the mess we're in now tell about where we're going to be with the uh, state archive. But the bill's introduced. Uh, the plan has been drafted. And we're going to have to deal with it. I talked to Milton Case just yesterday, who's got the bill. His committee's got it. As a matter of fact, he introduced <coughs> his names on it. And I had a little session with him yesterday, and he He's a little bit outdone over this. He wants to know why me and the manufacturers and other people can't get, a, get together on a green bill. And he tells me the manufacturers are opposed to this bill. I said, Melvin, I can't believe it. i got to see it first. Because I think the damn manufacturers and these anti-labor elements are behind this piece of legislation because they think they can control a state agency the damn side easier than they can a federal agency. You see? Now, question is, what do we do? We have to do something before long. Well, right. you can't just sit here and be our head in the sand. It's here. It's there. we got to deal with it. <coughs> People in Washington, I sent them a copy of the bill. Uh, George Taylor with the FLCO Legislative Department has been assigned to the thing. I've talked to him. And best I can determine the bill that we is a pretty darn good bill. The bill is actually a pretty good bill that we've got. 
Right. Pretty well meets the federal standard, much better than some of the other state laws. But uh, that's not really the question. The question is whether or not we want a state agency to police the act or whether we want to keep it under federal regulation. That's well, the answer. Answer. Haven't you stated in your previous meetings that this, uh, the need of this bill is for the standard for federal standards, monetarily uh, and every other way? Uh, yes, uh, Brother Tucker. Uh, in certain respects, it is. The penalty provision in the Act has been lowered according to the penalties of the federal statute. And I raised this question with Whitehead. I said, how in the hell if, are you going to lower the penalty provision and still meet the requirement of the federal statute? He says, well, the act says as long as it's as effective as the federal statute. And we think our state act will be as effective as the federal statute with a lower penalty. Well, that don't make damn sense, does it? Huh? We can let Mr. Foreman have the floor here for a minute. We run into a case last week where the, we went to the archer and requested uh, that they come into this plant because it was, we listed uh, 13 violations of safety law. And uh, because we, uh, because two of them was in my danger, Doubt it a bit, uh, you know, and with the with the uh, attitude of the present administration being in Washington, be what it is, where they actually are pushing for the states to take over this act, then we got real problems. We got, uh, I'm sure you know some of them. We got some people on this board now on federal. <coughs> Well, I'll, 
The State Department of Health. If we had it in, if they would agree to set up a State Department of Labor to police the thing, it'd be something else. I'm asking. It looks like this thing is going to be passed because there's a lot of people like, you know. You're going to have trouble stopping it. That's right. It would like to let the state do it. Uh, I wonder if there's any chance of getting this put in. Well, I've already got one guy, uh, Ed Jolly. Uh, uh, I, can, I can get the law with county people. There. Well, I tell you what, I got I done yesterday. I got Ed Jolly over there yesterday and told Ed I want him to get a copy of that bill and start looking it over. And I told him he he was talking about the State Department of Labor. And I told him I said, Ed, uh, I want you to get this bill and take a real close look at it and see what they're doing and what's about to happen. I said, Now it might be the answer to this whole thing. Is to get this bill and amend it whereby we create a State Department of Labor, put this thing under a State Department of Labor. Then they might give us some room. Uh, you know, we could look at it a little different. Right, uh, you know, well, we right. The the this thing, there's going to be a lot of money involved in this thing. It's going to, it's going to be something like a million dollars a year this put into this thing. This might be the only way that we'll ever get a State Department of Labor. I think the, I think this is one of uh, real good arguments we can have that uh, we can't support this legislation in the absence of the State Department of Labor. Which the fact that it don't meet the federal requirements. Huh? Which one of milk is committed at uh, public uh, uh, pension, social welfare, public health? That's House Bill 115, in case uh, you want to know. Uh, it's a lengthy son of a gun. Lengthy is a devil. It's on both sides of the paper there, too. It's very complicated. <coughs> well, we got that one out of the way. Let's see if we can't rush on here and get a couple of the others out of the way and let them get out of here. How about the county unit system? We never took an official position on that. I've already went into it a little bit. Are we for it or against it? I believe we support that. We support Legislation setting up the county unit system. Right. Get into right. any discussion on that. I don't think it could be any worse system than we've right. already got. You ready for the question? I don't think it could be any worse. All in favor of the motion, signify it to say it aye. Opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. Me and Eddie Kaye at the box <laughs> fight every time he shows up in here, anyhow. Uh, let's talk about the State Board of Education for a few minutes. The lay board. As it stands at the present time, the State Board of Education is made up of the State Superintendent of Education, the Attorney General, and the Secretary of State. In effect, the state superintendent of education pretty well serves as the state board. Uh, there's been a number of proposals over there about a state lay board of education and abolishing the possession of uh, superintendent of education and making them appointed by this lay board. I talked to Garvin Johnson recently about this whole setup. I at one time was uh, a little bit sympathetic with this idea of a uh, lay board and appointed position of uh, state superintendent. But after giving it some thought, seeing what some things went on around us, I've come to the conclusion that it would be stupid to abolish any elected position and make it appointed right now. <laughs> so I think we ought to stay with and the uh, elected. When you vote against it, when you got no with votes the state superintendent of education being an elected position. Can we get a motion on that? That'll help I'll me make out. A motion that we oppose appointing of the state. That we oppose making that position appointed. All right. Any discussion on that? All in favor of the motion, signify it to say an aye. All opposed? Now, on the proposal to create a lay board of education, uh, there's various and sunny proposals, but the the most uh, most of them will center around something like this, that we set up a lay board of education made up of nine members, three to be appointed or elected from each Supreme Court district. 
I'm of the opinion again that if we change up the state board of education and go to a lay board, and there might be some merit to the lay board idea, but if we do, that that should also be those positions should be elected and not appointed. They'd be elected by the voters in each one of the Supreme Court districts. Good. Have you got agreement on that? All right. That gives us, that, then I know where we are. Okay. All right. Any discussion on that one? Not all in favor of the motion signify to say an aye. Opposed? Motion carried and so ordered. Now, we still got several others down here that I call out to you, but I, that motion that Russell Kelly offered uh, will suffice. Uh, I can, uh, when the chiropractor bill is introduced, I'll pull the committee. Uh, oh, you might want to act on that one. You might want to take on that one. Huh? Well, the, I told you <coughs> earlier about the current situation with chiropractors. All they, they got to do is put out a shingle right now. All they got to do is put out a shingle. There's no no regulatory agency. They don't have to be licensed. And those people in the profession that are legitimate, for the last several years, have tried to get uh, a bill passed licensing chiropractors. Tom's uh, more familiar with them than I am. I haven't had to use one yet. But <coughs> there's no question of what there is a place for them. If we're going to have them, they ought to have certain rules and regulations to govern the professional Some body. qualifications, anyway. Yeah. So uh, we think, you know, that we've been approached by the profession, some of you guys have done it for one, about helping them get a license bill passed. Uh, I make a motion to support, support it. it. All right. Second. Any discussion? This gets to be a question on work. Sometimes that's one. That's another. That's a good thing you brought up. But until they're licensed and uh, recognized, and it's hard for you to use it. Right. That's well, that's one. Of the yeah. Me and this, uh, me and this bunch on this comprehensive uh, health plan in conference going to have words about this. You know, one guy in one meeting. They lied, crack about this legislation we're talking about now. Of course, the agenda was crowded, and I didn't have time to take him on, but I might not be part of that thing no more as that subject comes up one more time, because I'm going to straighten them out. I'm a sole believer in chiropractor. There's oddballs in that profession like there is in every other, you know? And I, I'm, I'm thoroughly convinced that, uh, that uh, they, they've got a right to be, and they ought to have some hey, system of regulating them. Keeping the oddballs from being the oddballs. But me and the other bunch is going to be way out. We got that motion. Uh, we hadn't voted on that one. No. Uh, let's take a vote on it. Uh, motion to uh, support legislation to license car practice. And, uh, and then I'll, you know, I'll take this up, these other matters up with the committee as outlined in that motion. Yeah. All any further motion signifies to say aye. Opposed? Motion carried and so on. We, well, it wasn't so bad it wasn't getting so late, we'd get into some more of these things, but the motion that Russell offered will suffice. Now, let's uh, skip the rest of the legislators and see if we got any new business anybody here would like to bring up. Good and welfare. I'd like uh, somebody to draw up a resolution or something with these people who worked so diligently in this election and, and commend them for the job that they did. I mean, we wrote everything. Yeah. These, what do you mean? Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, yeah. Well, I yeah. think uh, yeah. it'd be appropriate right now for the, for the board to go on record and adopt a motion, uh, <coughs> a motion of appreciation for the work done by Amy Hollowell and Bob Woodson and, and uh, everybody else uh, in the area uh, for their cooperation in the past election. That'd be appropriate now. Yeah, I think so. I mean, that's Why what I was thinking about. Thing. It'd be in a minute. That's right. Why it'd be in a minute. That's the young lady right there. You offer motion. that motion? Yes. I mean, All right. A motion is offered that uh, the board go on record is voicing its appreciation for the 
work performed by Amy Hollowell and Bob Woodson and and a number of other people that worked so hard and diligently in a recent congressional election. We got a second to that? And all in favor of the motion signify it to say an aye. Aye. All opposed? Now I wonder how much uh, time Amy spent on you to get that one on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> I talked to the lady about, what, 20 minutes one day on the way to work. That's what it was about. <laughs> well, I think that wraps it up. We can get by with the motion. Russell takes it, uh, offered a while ago on these other matters. So I'm sure we'll be conferring with the members of the committee. Uh, I assume that all of you got your vouchers. And you, if you if you want to take them home with you, send them in, you can. If you want to take it up with Miss Phillips, uh, the checkbook she has, that she can take care of them now. Uh, let me wish all of you the best of luck on your way back. I think if I was you, I'd be spending the night instead of trying to drive back. Appreciate you coming. As soon as we get the pictures developed, I'll send you copies. You got a good one, now. Okay. Well, we'll be in touch with you, I know, Bob. Are you going to work for that? Yeah, maybe.